the 2022 LAEDC Economic Forecast. To kick us off, please welcome to the stage Chair of the LAEDC Board of Governors, Rudy Medina. Good morning. Wow, everybody's quiet so quickly. We're going to get started, but we do know that there's quite a few folks still out there uh, because of the uh, valet situation. But good morning, everybody, and welcome to the economic forecast. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't start this meeting by saying congratulations to one of our members, the Super Bowl champion, Los Angeles Rams. My name is Rudy Medina. I'm honored to be the chair of the LAEDC, and I'd like to share a few major highlights for this past year. These highlights have resulted from the hard work of our dedicated team and the unique connections that the LAEDC has created between business, government, education, and community partners, essentially all of us that are here today. The LAEDC's mission is to reinvent our economy to collaboratively advance growth and prosperity for all. My work with the LAEDC since 2016 has been one of the most rewarding and important aspects of my career in banking. And I hope that you too will see the benefits of supporting this incredible organization. Just this year alone, the LAEDC reached a significant milestone. The LAEDC has attracted more than 250,000 jobs for the LA area residents through the direct technical assistance provided by its award-winning business assistance program. In the most challenging year for small businesses in the 25-year history of the program, the team tackled the unprecedented small business crisis with additional staff, one-on-one -on -one consulting, extraordinary resources, and record levels of outreach with at-risk small businesses. In addition, the LAEDC Center for Competitive Workforce team connected with more than 150 community college faculty with dozens of industry leaders and more than 1,000 students to ensure our region's training programs are driven by both real job market data and genuine employer demand. We've helped local workers get training or retraining they need to access high-paying jobs in high-growth industry sectors and thrive in the post-pandemic economy. And finally, the LAEDC continues its work to advance economic and social equity with the LA Digital Equity Action League, the LA Deal. In partnership with Unite LA and more than 100 public and private partners. This collaborative, community driven process is tackling the vast broadband internet gaps in many communities across the LA region, which COVID 19 highlighted, and which must be solved to ensure truly inclusive economic recovery for all our neighbors, small businesses here in LA County. The effectiveness of the LAEDC's program is remarkable because its integrated approach allows it to bring business assistance and workforce development teams, economic research and industry labor market analysts, and the World Trade Center LA team together to advance its mission. Now, I'd like to ask the Board of Governors and the Executive Committee members of the LAEDC here today to stand and be recognized. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Thank you all for your support. Data always guides the LAEDC strategy. And today, and today is a special morning with lots of important data and information that will help guide your businesses, government institution, and workforce development strategies through an economy that is in very much a transition. Now, to help advance the program, I'd like to welcome a tireless leader 
of our regional economy, LAEDC's fearless leader, President and CEO, Bill Allen. Let's have a hand for the chairman of the board of the LADC, Rudy Medina. Rudy has given so generously of time uh, to me, to our staff, to our organization as chairman of our board, and he is a big part of our success. So thank you for stepping up and being the civic steward that you are. Welcome, everyone. It is so great to see you all here in person this morning. It's wonderful to be here together after months and months of convening by Zoom, supporting our local hotel and meeting and conference industry on their way back from this terrible pandemic. The fact that you chose this forecast over the rally for the Rams is amazing to me. We're so thrilled to have you here and it's a sign that you're here hungry for information to help you make more informed decisions in the year ahead. To expand just briefly on Rudy's remarks, the LADC champions equitable economic growth for everyone here in Los Angeles County. Through our collaborations with community and government and business and education, we work to inform and advance our data-driven and evidence-based approach. Our endeavor is to achieve a reimagined economy for Los Angeles County, one that is more robust, one that is more equitable, one that is more sustainable, one that is more resilient, and one that really helps support a healthy and high standard of living for all of our 10 million neighbors here across the county. Our staff and members represent the diversity of this great county. We act as trusted conveners, thought leaders, valued service providers, regional stewards, and transformational change catalysts. Our data-driven, research-based approach is used to cultivate key industries and innovation ecosystems, to retain and grow our micro-enterprises, our small and large businesses, to attract investment from domestic and international enterprises, and to develop a competitive and inclusive regional workforce to both power this economy and benefit from this nation-sized $700 billion Los Angeles County economy. As Rudy noted, this economy is very much in transition with continued disruption and uncertainty ahead. And you'll hear quite a bit about that this morning. It's important that we understand the forces and trends at play and that we seek to leverage them for our collective benefit as civic stewards, as government, business, education, and community leaders, as innovative and aspirational entrepreneurs, as labor market participants, as consumers, as investors. We hope that what we present to you today and the extraordinary speakers we've assembled for your benefit will shed important light on the many challenges and opportunities that lie ahead of us. With this information, we think we can all make more informed decisions in 2022 and help us advance that more robust, equitable, inclusive, and resilient economy for all. A forecast like this requires a lot of effort to put on, and it can't be done without the support of our sponsors. And I just want to take a moment to thank these extraordinary civic stewards who make this sort of event and information possible for you this morning. I want to begin by recognizing our gold sponsor, Working Nation, and its visionary founder, Art Bilger, and its wonderful, incredible CEO, Jane Oates, who you'll hear from later this morning. I want to thank our silver sponsors, U.S. Bank. Thank you again, Rudy Medina, for your support of this event as you support so much of the work of our mission. The Los Angeles Regional Consortium of Community Colleges, our primary partners in workforce development, fueling the talent pipeline for this region's economy. And AWS, Amazon Web Services, whose California Cloud Computing Certificate Program is a shining example of the sort of industry-driven career education that we seek so much more of across this region to enable our neighbors to participate in this extraordinary economy. We'd also like to thank our amazing array of bronze sponsors. You'll see their names and logos on the screen for their support of this event and their commitment to advancing our mission. Let's acknowledge all of our wonderful sponsors this morning. 
The LADC's annual economic forecasts are Southern California's premier source of economic information and insight into our future here in this region. We have a great program for you this morning, a wonderful keynote who will be visiting us virtually, but I think you'll really enjoy her presentation. Julia Coronado, president and founder of Macro Policy Perspectives, and you'll hear from our very own director of our Institute for Applied Economics, Shannon Sedgwick, with our regional forecast, which is always highly anticipated. You'll then get the opportunity to attend one of three breakout sessions. I wish we could have you attend all of them. They're just going to be extraordinary. We have chosen them because each of them is a critical lever for achieving the sort of inclusive economic recovery and long-term prosperity that we seek. They'll be on innovation, they'll be on infrastructure, they'll be on housing. We encourage you to choose one, share with each other what you learn if you're here in a group, divide up. Um, and then come back for uh, the closing session in which we'll have Aaron Osmond, the U.S. leader for the education and workforce team in the global public sector division of Amazon Web Services. Aaron will lead a final discussion back here with all of our panelists to discuss the surge of federal funding that's on our way to our region in 2022 and how those funds should be utilized to ensure the advancement of economic growth and prosperity for all of our neighbors here in the region. Uh, once again, we are incredibly fortunate to have with us the voice of business news in Los Angeles as our MC, uh, our dear friend Frank Motek, who uh, has a wonderful program called Motek on Money on 790 ABC every evening at 6 o'clock. We had the opportunity to be on it last week to uh, forecast a little bit of what today would be like. I think he has another session planned tonight with Shannon. He's always so good about covering this regional economy and helping us spread the word of the LADC. He's been with us more than a decade moderating this program. In fact, his Motec on Money show just won the Golden Mike Award uh, from the Southern California Radio and Television Association. Um, he's an extraordinary asset for us here in Los Angeles to tell the story about this complex and diverse economy. And I'm happy to turn the program over to him to introduce our keynote speakers and get us underway. Will you please welcome the voice of business news in Los Angeles, Frank Motec. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias, estimado público. Guten Morgen. I see the Consul General of Germany is in the audience, Stefan Schneider. Quite an international gathering here again today. Thank you very much, Bill Allen, for that generous introduction here today. It's wonderful to see you, Bill, and everyone here in person this morning. Nothing like a real social networking site to uh, get us all together once again. And uh, I'm not on mute, am I? Can everybody hear me? Okay, thank you for that. Bill, thank you very much for bringing us together for this important occasion once again, and thank you for your tremendous leadership during the most dramatic and difficult times we've ever seen. Let's have a huge round of applause for Bill Allen, President and CEO of the LAEDC. Now the recovery is on, as Rudy Medina mentioned, and we're off to a following a stellar weekend for the LA economy, by the way, which uh, we talked about, Bill, on the air the other day, uh, heading up to the Rams winning the Super Bowl and that big parade coming right down the street here pretty soon, so we're getting ready for that. We'll probably be able to cheer them on. Uh, it was awesome to see the hotels and restaurants packed over the weekend, a lot of energy in town over the weekend, and gosh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal walking around uh, Beverly Hills, can't miss him, of course. He, at Spago and uh, all the great uh, parties and even saw Cato Kalin at a party. So things are starting to get back to normal here uh, in Los Angeles on the, uh, the social scene. It's delighted to see that. Now on the economy today, and I'm sure we'll be uh, covering this tonight, retail sales jumped 3.8 percent as the economy perked up in the face of the highest inflation in 40 years. The notes from the Fed's last policy setting meeting will be coming out uh, later this morning. Financial markets, of course, uh, watching the serious situation in Eastern Europe along the Russia-Ukraine border. Russia says it's drawing down troops, but NATO says it's actually continuing its military buildups. We're watching the situation there very closely. We do see oil up again this morning, back above $94 a barrel, a seven-year high. LA gas prices, in case you hadn't noticed, at all-time highs again, and uh, we're watching that very closely and paying the price. The Dow down 200 right now, NASDAQ down 130, and the S&P 500 down 28. And now the weather, mostly sunny today, with a high up around 
66, low tonight 45. We're showing 50 right now here in downtown Los Angeles. And now on to the forecast. You've all uh, come to hear this morning an important forecast, which I know many of you use to plan uh, your year. First, I invite all of you to take a look at the printed one pager you received this morning. You'll notice a QR code on the bottom left corner. You can hold your cell phone's camera at that code and you'll get immediate access to today's program, speaker bios, and the full economic forecast report. Because all of us love the environment and support our green initiatives, we only have the reports available for you digitally. We also invite you to join the conversation on social media this morning. You can follow us at the handle at LAEDC and also hashtag LA Economy. Of course, remember in the olden days, I said, oh, put your cell phones away, you know, but it, in fact, we want to encourage just the opposite. Go ahead and take them out, take plenty of pictures, and of course, uh, use those hashtags and uh, that handle at LAEDC. Now, it's an honor to introduce the main event here this morning, the economic forecast being presented by Shannon Sedgwick, the LAEDC Institute for Applied Economics works year-round gathering information and providing all sorts of influential research and analysis on the regional economy. They identify leading industry clusters and labor market characteristics, forces and policies impacting both. It's now an honor to introduce the director of the Institute of Applied Economics and the author of many of the most insightful reports on this region, economist Shannon Sedgwick. She will give her forecast presentation of highlights for the 2022 Economic Forecast Report. And again, that is available for you today via the QR code printed on your program. Please welcome to the stage the LAEDC's Director of Institute for Applied Economics, economist Shannon Sedgwick. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy in the new year. Uh, thank you for joining us for the annual LADC, fo LADC forecast as we look forward to what is in store for our state and local economy. Uh, this time last year, we highlighted how COVID-19 had increased the severity of pre-existing challenges and, and inequalities that were present in our region and beyond. Uh, while pre-existing inequity and the disparate effects of the pandemic make an inclusive recovery a necessity uh, for, more, for more equitable growth in the long term, with the ongoing pandemic, it's really too soon to tell how successful some of these efforts taken to reach this goal have been. So this year, we zoom back out a bit to capture the wide array of developments and upcoming events that are poised to impact us all in this upcoming year. In addition to our economic outlook, we cover a few key transformative shifts and future influences at the national, state, and local levels. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically altered the lives and significantly impacted regional, state, national, and global economies. Despite two surges related to the Delta and Omicron variants, Los Angeles County experienced a significant turn towards normalcy in 2021 with relatively high vaccination rates. The labor market was negatively impacted by the pandemic in 2020, but made an impressive recovery in 2021 with the year being characterized by expansionary fiscal and monetary policy, increasing vaccination numbers, and the lifting of pandemic-related restrictions. However, employment is still below the pre-pandemic level. Additionally, the sudden and the significant decline in the labor force participation rate during the pandemic has been slow to recover. Uh, it'll be a key metric to watch going forward. If workers do not fully return to the labor force in the coming years, the economy will have to make significant adjustments in response to the new labor picture. One of the potential clouds we identified in last year's forecast, inflation, has been taking center stage lately. The federal government enacted demand-stimulating combined fiscal and monetary policy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic in an attempt to support economic recovery. However, these expansionary macroeconomic policies have been 
principal causes of significant recent price inflation. The inflation rate rose to 7% in 2021, representing the highest inflation rate since 1982. The rise in energy prices, specifically gasoline, is leading the increase, but food and shelter are up significantly too. There are two main contributors to rising price levels. We're experiencing a positive demand shock and a negative supply shock. A significant portion of households found themselves with increased household income related to changed spending habits, stimulus payments, and expanded unemployment benefits, which boosted their demand for goods, applying upward pressure on prices. At the same time, supply chains have been falling short of meeting this increased demand, which also applies upward pressure on the general price level. While inflation impacts the entire economy, low-income individuals are often particularly negatively affected by rapidly rising prices. Higher rates of inflation reduce wages in real terms for all earners, but disproportionately impacts lower-income households who have less disposable income. With a higher percentage of their income spent on necessities, these households cannot offset rising prices by shifting discretionary spending like higher-income households are able to do. Looking ahead, we expect a tightening of monetary policy. Uh, federal funds rate, rate hikes are on the table to ease rising inflation concerns. Now let's dive into our economic outlook for California through 2023. California had some of the strictest coronavirus regulations in the nation, which heavily impacted economic growth in 2020. Real GDP growth dropped by 2.8% in 2020, and with the lifting of restrictions, uh, the LADC anticipates growth to have reached 6.7 in 2021. Moderate but still fairly strong growth is projected for this year, with real GDP growth forecast, forecasted at 4.2% for 2022 and 2.7% the following year. LA County growth declined by 6.3% in 2020, and real GDP growth is expected to grow faster than the state, reaching 6.8% in 2021, 4.6% in 2022, and 2.6% 2 in 2023. Continued economic recovery should bring the unemployment rate in California from 7.7% in 2021, down to 5.7% in 2022, and 4.6% by the end of 2023, returning closer to the pre-pandemic norm. LA County is also expected to see a significant decline in its unemployment rate as tourism-related industries continue to return to pre-pandemic levels. Increased unemployment benefits and economic stimulus payments led to a rise in personal income in 2020 and to a lesser degree in 2021. We anticipate a decline in 2022 as these payments have concluded. In subsequent years, personal income will rise once again as the California and Los Angeles economy continue their recovery. Due to structural distortions that existed long before the pandemic, low-income workers, small businesses, people of color, and women have continued to be disproportionately impacted by the virus in terms of cases, deaths, jobs lost, and business, insolvenc business insolvencies. We see that still holds true when we look at the unemployment rate broken out for different groups. UI claims data can act as an early indicator of what may transpire in the labor market prior to the more accurate monthly and quarterly figures that publication. Here we see that initial UI claims in California have moved closer to pre-pandemic levels, hinting at a continued recovery in the near term. In 2020, California mirrored the national employment experience with service sectors being hardest hit in terms of employment. In general, those hardest hit industries recovered the greatest number of jobs in 2021. Looking ahead, all industries are projected to expand over the next two years in the state, with professional and business services leading the way as people return to office settings, leisure and hospitality falling behind second um, as people return to pre-pandemic activity in terms of tourism and entertainment, 
and trade, transportation, and utilities, rounding out of the third top contributor uh, to future employment growth as uh, investment in infrastructure starts to come online. This year, our economy is in a period of transition. 2022 pretends to be a year of change as our economy continues to recover from and adapt to the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. As time has progressed, it's become abundantly clear that the pandemic has led to permanent changes in the economy. We explore multiple economy-wide shifts that were taking place prior to COVID-19 that have been accelerated, including remote work effects and their associated economy-wide consequences, increased digitization of service provision, labor market supply shifts, and the accelerated shift towards e-commerce. The Federal Reserve is at a critical juncture um, where it must skillfully plan and execute monetary policy to control inflation, while also avoiding a significant slowdown or even reversal in our economic recovery. They plan to do this by reducing its monthly bond purchasing and raising interest rates this year. Great care must be taken not to tighten monetary policy in a way that will disrupt the ongoing economic recovery. Remote work has allowed many businesses to stay open throughout the pandemic. While initially considered by many to be a temporary measure, remote work is here to stay in one form or another. Uh, a recent survey finds that only 23% of workers want to uh, go back to the full-time office environment, with older white males being well represented in that group. Women and people of color report a preference for remote work and comprise a larger share of the 45% of workers who want a hybrid schedule and the 32% that don't want to return to the office at all. And what have workers been doing with the extra time while they're not commuting to their job? Well, 40% of that extra time has been spent doing extra work. A recent study found that around 59 million US workers performed freelance work in 2021. That equates uh, to approximately 36% of the US labor force. The share of the labor force categorized as non-temporary freelance has um, increased as high skill workers are leaving their conventional full-time work uh, for flexible employment alternatives. Remote work was cited as the top reason for entering the freelance workforce, being mentioned by around 54% of new entrants. Freelance work is expected to keep growing over time. Around 56% of non-freelance employees that were surveyed in the study answered that they are likely to freelance in the future. Increased digitization in the provision of services during the COVID-19 pandemic will likely result in permanent changes in how certain services are provided along with associated cost and labor market implications. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the pre-pandemic shift towards e-commerce and away from brick and mortar establishments. Small businesses may find creating or expanding an online presence to be necessary in the new e-commerce age. We also identify shifts in upcoming influences that are specific to California and Los Angeles County. Housing affordability and availability issues combined with negative economic effects of COVID-19 encouraged a record-setting number of California residents to seek alternative, more affordable places to live during the pandemic. California has been losing uh, relatively low and middle-income residents to other states while gaining relatively high-income residents from other jurisdictions. However, high-income residents, they're leaving too. Uh, compared to other California counties from July 2020 to July of 2021, Los Angeles County experienced the greatest fall in overall population, followed by the nine-county San Francisco Bay. In 2022, California will become the first U.S. state to mandate a $15 minimum wage for businesses with over 25 employees. 
Increasing the minimum wage will raise the hourly wages paid to employees who currently earn less than the proposed minimum wage and who retain their positions. What happens next is more uncertain and depends on the behavioral responses of all economic actors in the region, including employers, employees, and non-working job seekers, and how these in turn generate downstream impacts. Parts of the state with higher concentrations of low-skilled employees will likely experience the more pronounced effects. The pandemic has served to accelerate the number of business uh, headquarters leaving California for other states. More business headquarter relocations took place in just the first half of 2021, that's from January to June, than in all of 2018 and 2020. And only four fewer took place during that six month period than in all of 2019. Surveyed business executives cited high cost of housing and real estate and the high cost of doing business as primary reasons for not locating, not expanding, or for leaving California. Governor Newsom's California Blueprint plans to spend billions addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis, economic inequality, homelessness, and crime. While only proposed for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, it represents an important step towards addressing many of the state's most significant and enduring challenges. Home values in Los Angeles County closed in 2021, about 2.5 times higher than the value of the typical home in the US. Housing demand during the pandemic increased for a variety of reasons, including increased cash balances for down payments, low mortgage interest rates, and remote work effects. However, this increase in home values uh, is the product of a long-term trend as well. Although home value increases are expected to slow in the near future, we expect the trend to continue unless there's a substantial housing supply increase or an economic shock that serves to significantly decrease the demand for homes. Upcoming labor negotiations in several key industries in LA County are scheduled to take place this year, including contract negotiations in the film and television industry and the United Steel Workers Union contract with petroleum refineries. That's actually happening right now. Uh, the collective bargaining agreement between the International Longshore and Warehouse Union and PMA, which represents uh, terminal operators, um, is set for the middle of this year. And that can have a significant and wide-reaching impact if a work uh, stoppage ensues. Across all negotiations for new labor agreements, resolving any potential disputes quickly and effectively will be key to keeping these industries and the larger economy on the path to full recovery. And last but not least, the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare how differences in access to internet, affordability of internet, device ownership, and digital literacy, a group of concepts known as the digital divide, put up barriers to schooling, working from home, attending telehealth appointments, and many other facets of life. Investments are being made into closing the divide, which disproportionately impacts residents in the historically underserved neighborhoods where there are fewer internet service providers, lower adoption rates, and less fiber infrastructure. Um, the LADC has been heavily involved in the effort to close the digital divide here in Los Angeles County. If you're interested in finding out more, um, you can see that on our website, and I can direct you first to LA Deal, our efforts with LA Deal. So all of these transformative shifts and upcoming influences have the potential to impact our economy over the next year, um, but the pandemic itself introduces the most uncertainty, uh, potential future variants and private and public sector behavioral responses to future COVID-19 developments will directly impact the trajectory of our ongoing recovery. Looking forward, the next two years will be characterized by 
continued recovery, uh, was still expected to take multiple years, however, for the economy to fully recover from the pandemic-induced uh, shock, especially for industries that have been hardest hit. Recovery for some industries that are undergoing fundamental changes as a result of the pandemic may bring uh, permanent changes after a period of disrupted transition. Fiscal and monetary policy have played a key role in determining where we currently find ourselves and where we expect to go over the next couple of years. We can expect a tightening of monetary policy through federal funds rate hikes to address rising inflation concerns. At the same time, more money will be injected into the economy through additional fiscal policy measures, including the $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill, uh, which is expected to bring at least $39.4 billion uh, into California over the next five years. While significant investment in infrastructure will begin funding large projects and will provide much needed jobs across the skills spectrum, the expansionary fiscal policy spending could further apply increasing inflationary pressure. The, so the big risk here is that contractionary monetary policy that might not be well planned and executed uh, could potentially lead to a recession. Lastly, population growth and housing accessibility chronically troubled Golden State. Uh, going forward, we need to ensure that we continue to allocate time and resources to address our state's longstanding challenges and to become more resilient and create more widely shared prosperity. I want to thank you for your time this morning. Um, and I'd like to take a quick moment to acknowledge my IAE team, the Institute's team, um, who've worked hard to prepare this forecast for all of you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, economist Shannon Sedgwick, for that comprehensive update and outlook on the Los Angeles economy. And again, I'd also like to salute the entire team at the Institute for Applied Economics. Looking forward to speaking with you on the air tonight, Shannon, about that report that was just released. And again, anyone who wants to review the details can access it easily on the program that you have in front of you on that QR code on the bottom left corner. Our next keynote speaker will be joining us virtually this morning. Let's give a warm welcome from all of us here in Los Angeles, and thank you very much uh, for being here. She'll be appearing on the screen shortly. Dr. Julia Coronado is founder of the economic research firm Macro Policy Perspectives and a clinical associate professor at the Macomb School of Business at the University of Texas in Austin. She received her BA in economics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. After receiving her PhD, she worked as a staff economist at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington for eight years. She's published scholarly articles on issues related to pension, finances, and market valuations, social security, retirement savings, and behavior and the frontier of private and public data collection, digital currency, as well as monetary policy. She's represented the United States at OECD meetings on financial market issues and has testified before Congress on social security reform, as well as central bank digital currency, some of the hottest topics now. She's a member of the Economic Advisory Panel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and Economic Studies Council at the Brookings Institution and is currently the Vice President of the National Association of Business Economics, which uh, is the group, I believe, that calls a uh, recession. So I'll be interested to hear what she has to say about that. Dr. Julia Coronado, welcome to Los Angeles virtually. Good morning to you and greetings from all of us here in LA. Let's have a round of applause for Dr. Julia Coronado, our keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, thank you for that warm uh, welcome and that nice introduction. I'm going to just give you a high level national uh, perspective on the economy. Shannon did an outstanding job of providing you with some both uh, national perspective and local perspective. 
Uh, so I'm going to try to weave a narrative about where we are and uh, how we got here and, and how things might change um, to preview some of my conclusions. Uh, it's, you know, there's, we're in a, a tremendously disrupted economy. We're moving out of the pandemic. We're moving into the post-pandemic and endemic world. We still live with COVID-19, so there are still some frictions. And as Shannon noted, some lasting changes in behavior, where we work, how we entertain ourselves, what we're comfortable doing, uh, that will probably prove lasting. And that brings with it disruptions to the structure of the economy. So let's move to that uh, first slide. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm relying on the IV people to, uh, to move things along. We have just uh, experienced the strongest recovery uh, in decades. So we have GDP growth estimated at 5.5% for 2021, strongest since the early 80s. Uh, that's on the left-hand side there. Um, the right-hand side chart shows you the payroll uh, progression and it compares it to prior business cycles. So you can see we lost a historic amount of jobs very quickly in two months. And since then, we've been experiencing one of the most rapid jo uh, job recoveries in decades and in fact have short-circuited uh, what was emerging as a pattern over the last three uh, recoveries of what we used to call jobless recoveries. Uh, we would lose a lot of jobs and it would take years and years and years to recover them. Uh, we are on track for a, a quicker recovery of the jobs lost. As Shannon noted, we still haven't recovered all of them, uh, but we are well on our way and did so over a very short period of time. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, you know, one of the, how did we get here? How did we achieve such a recovery? Well, it wasn't organic. Uh, it was definitely driven by a heavy dose of monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, the fiscal policy response is highlighted in that left-hand side chart. You can see that uh, that's disposable income indexed to 2019. The green line is disposable uh, personal income and the blue line is real wage gains. Uh, so real compensation that workers take home. Uh, so again, if we look back to the great recession of 2008 and nine, you can see that the loss of labor income wasn't as sharp, uh, but the recovery was very slow. We sort of slipped down to a lower trend line than we were on before the great recession and policy did not do much to offset that. Uh, in terms of fiscal transfers. So tax cuts or payments to individuals were very de minimis and real disposable income and uh, take home pay were pretty much in sync. This, this cycle, totally different. That It's hard to understate the significance of that green line during this current uh, uh, episode. Uh, we've never seen the government provide so much cash support to households through a variety of mechanisms. And not only did it make up for the sharp drop in labor income, uh, it, it more than made up for that. So that over the last two years, household disposable income has been well above pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and that's a pretty unique uh, situation. Uh, we are now sort of handing the baton back. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk, come back to that uh, in a minute. The right hand side shows you the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet as a percent of GDP. So again, relative to the prior cycle where we did QE, then QE2, then QE3, we just went guns blazing, go big, go early was the mantra. The pandemic is nobody's fault. Time is of the essence. Let's get, uh, let's get that policy support out the door as quickly as possible. Uh, so the Fed expanded its balance sheet. That meant, meant record low uh, mortgage rates, interest rates, massive waves of people refinancing to lower house payments and buying homes, uh, as well as enjoying a wealth effect from the support that Fed policies provide to uh, financial markets more broadly. So massive policy response. If we go to the next slide, you can see that it's been a boom across the board. Consumer spending has been strong. Uh, corporate profits have been strong. Business fixed investment has been strong. Housing has boomed. Uh, the left-hand side chart there shows you that 
uh, delinquencies. These are delinquencies on consumer loans. So student loans always have the highest delinquency rates. That's the yellow line. They plunged on the moratorium on payments, the, the delinquencies on those loans. Um, mortgage delinquencies fell because there was a lot of forbearance offered to household. Millions of households took advantage of the opportunity. If you were affected by job loss through COVID, you could turn off your mortgage payment uh, for six months or more. And then that those missed payments are just tacked onto the end of your uh, loan. You didn't have to make up for them. Uh, so that was an important innovation in leading to lower mortgage delinquencies, but even car loans, uh, credit card loans, other consumer loans, saw delinquencies fall through the recession. We've never seen anything like that. So consumers are coming out of the recession with stronger credit quality, stronger balance sheets. Uh, and again, it didn't come at the expense of profits. The right-hand side shows profits. So uh, it, it, it really, you know, sort of the, the policy lifted all boats. Um, but the pandemic came with some a lot of disruptions. So if we move to the next slide, that highlights one of the disruptions that we see. Um, the uh, if you are, are we on the next slide? So the you should see there we go. So you should see consumer spending on goods and services. Goods is the right hand side. Services is the left hand side. Again, we're indexing these. Uh, spending streams to be 11019. So what you can see is we because we were locked down and we could not spend spend money on travel or restaurants or even dental services, uh, hotel and uh, uh, air transportation, hair salons, all of that plunged sharply. Uh, meanwhile, good spending surged. Uh, furnishings, uh, cars, clothing, people sat at home and ordered goods, and we've never seen such a massive shift in uh, spent and what consumers spend money on. Uh, so that was one major shift that led to, you know, uh, demand shifts faster than supply. So supply chains have struggled to keep up with that booming goods demand. Meanwhile, a lot of areas of the service sector are still coming back. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, Another one that Shannon touched on, uh, we saw a surge in household formation and moving around the country. The left-hand side chart shows you household formation. The blue line is total occupied housing units. The green bars are just the change in those. So you can see there was a surge in moving uh, over the last year or so, and now we're starting to level off. Uh, so uh, people moved out of LA, people moved out of New York, they moved into Austin, Texas, where I uh, reside. And, uh, and that caused a lot of uh, shifting in rents and home prices. Um, the right hand side chart highlights some of the disruption, you know, some industries are still this is um, total net job loss through January. Uh, in the last employment report. So we're still a little bit under 2% below pre-pandemic employment levels overall, uh, but industries like leisure and hospitality are still well below pre-pandemic levels, whereas areas like transportation and warehousing, uh, which are the areas of the economy moving goods around, are way above pre-pandemic levels of employment. So a big shift in where people are working in what people are spending money on uh, is you know, a lasting imprint from the pandemic. And of course, as Shannon touched on, and as we all know, if you go on to the next slide, we're all feeling it, uh, inflation. So this is the three, six and 12 month rate of consumer inflation massive policy support plus pandemic frictions left us with the highest inflation since the early 80s. So on a number of fronts, we're seeing the fastest uh, economic dynamics that we've seen since the 80s. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the question where it's, it's broad based, it's started in goods, uh, it has spread to services. Uh, what is going to, wh where do we go from here? Uh, is are we can we navigate to a soft landing for the U.S. economy? That's of course the policymakers' goals. And if we look on the next slide, 
what we can see is that fiscal policy is actually set to be quite contractionary relative to 2021. Yes, we do have an infrastructure bill. That's money that's going to be spent over the next 10 years. So there will be allocations, but actually spending that money on longer term infrastructure projects is something that takes quite a bit of time. Meanwhile, that transfer income has gone away entirely. So the child tax credit expired. Last one was in December. Um, some people will get some nice tax returns based on the catch up of that. But going forward, no more stimulus payments, no more child tax credits. Uh, so uh, the relative, the boost to uh, disposable income is gone. And so consumers now fall back to spending what they earn out of labor income. The left hand side highlights that direct federal spending is projected by the Congressional Budget Office to decline 20%. Um, so this is the, the, the dilemma for forecasters. Households have accumulated a lot of savings on their balance sheets. Their balance sheets are very strong, but their disposable income is actually going to be flat to down, even in a strong labor market, just because all of that transfer income goes away. Uh, so uh, the right hand shot side shows you model calibrations of the fiscal impulse. So whereas it added up to four or 5% of GDP in the last couple of years, it's set to subtract two to 3% of GDP. We don't expect a hard landing because of it, because so much of it has been saved. Uh, and I'll return to that, but there certainly is a notable tightening in the stance of fiscal policy this year, right away, starting now. Uh, and then at the same time, as Shannon noted, if we go on to the next slide, the Fed is signaling they're going to start raising rates. They may do more rather than let what was expected just a few uh, short months ago. They're going to reduce their balance sheet. That has led to uh, some rising interest rates. I, I did a Bloomberg screenshot here of a uh, uh, of the mortgage rates, the daily mortgage rates that you can get in Bloomberg, just to show you that we're above four percent. We're at four and a quarter on mortgage rates that hasn't sort of filtered through to the retail rates yet, but that's gonna that's coming soon to a mortgage banker near you. Uh, so this is one of the fastest increases in mortgage rates we've seen because not only does it reflect the rising treasury yields as the Fed moves to raise short-term interest rates, that quantitative tightening that the Fed has signaled has led to widening mortgage spreads. So really a lot tighter financing conditions Certainly refinancing has gone is basically going down to zero. Uh, a lot of a huge amount of refinancing was done over the last couple of years. Um, that's behind us. There's still a lot of uh, momentum in the housing market. So we don't think it's going to derail the market overall necessarily, but it will definitely cool it off. Uh, mortgages are going to be more expensive. Houses are going to be more expensive. So the question really is, is this enough? is what the Fed is signaling, is what's coming down the pipeline in the uh, fiscal policy sphere, enough to cool off the economy enough, but not too much. Uh, and one of the hot questions is whether we have a wage price spiral. Um, one metric we use, if we look to the next slide, one way we gauge that is by looking at the labor share of GDP, uh, which is shown in the left-hand side chart there. The right hand side chart shows you that wage gains are very strong. They're above 5% by uh, the Atlanta wage growth tracker, just exceeded in January 5%. Uh, the employment cost index is, has risen quite a bit, strongest pace of gains since the 90s. Uh, but, you know, this has also come with the strongest recovery we've seen in decades. So basically workers are just keeping up with that booming uh, GDP, nominal GDP. So real GDP is booming, prices are booming, wages are booming. And so the labor share, which is how much are workers getting in compensation as a percent of GDP shows you that we spiked up during uh, the uh, COVID recession because lower income workers uh, as, as Shannon highlighted, were the hardest hit by the pandemic job losses early on. 
Um, and so uh, higher income workers that work from home were the ones still working and the uh, labor share of GDP jumped up. Since then, it's been flat to down. So again, that it's above where we were uh, throughout last recovery. Uh, we have seen the labor share of GDP decline in recent decades, reflecting a number of factors, global forces, um, but it sort of is a proxy for worker bargaining power. The labor market's very tight, but at least by this metric, just kind of keeping pace and not really showing us a wholesale change in labor bargaining power. But that's an open question going forward is, how uh, one question is, do consumers who no longer have stimulus return to sort of the kinds of price sensitivity we saw before the pandemic? So firms have enjoyed a lot of pricing power when we were pumping cash into people's bank accounts. As that cash dissipates and people have to spend out of their labor income, do they become more price sensitive? They also can now spend money on a wider array of services in addition to goods. Do they start responding to those higher prices uh, by becoming a bit pickier? Um, and uh, do workers bid up wages uh, more and or do workers keep bidding up wages? It is a strong job market. If we look at the next slide, um, there's a lot of gains that we're seeing that we expect to continue. Um, I can show you slides on the job openings or the, the quit rates, which show the great resignation. These are a couple of other slides. That the left hand uh, highlights the recovery we've seen to date in labor force participation. So one of the pandemic frictions has been that we are still way below, this is looking at workers age 25 to 54. We are way below prior levels of labor force participation. People are grappling with childcare challenges. People are have maybe rethought some of their preferences for work. Uh, and the question is, where will this go? Will we see more people coming back to the workforce? Uh, will that ease uh, some of the supply demand imbalance uh, in the labor market? And we are seeing a nice robust rebound in labor force participation. We certainly expect that to continue once that gets going in a recovery, it tends to keep going. So we think there's a lot of further gains we can see this year, especially uh, with pandemic concerns ebbing and offices reopening. We expect to see more recovery there. The right hand side shows you one of the more impressive features of the labor market. It, this is the number of people working part time but wanting full time work. So that was one of the massive dimensions of underemployment in the last, uh, in the Great Recession and the recovery. It took so long. There were so many people living with the precarity of part-time work, wanting the security of a full-time job, not being able to get it. Um, we went, have gone now well below pre-pandemic lows. Uh, we, there's every reason to expect, this is workers who are engaged in the workforce. They are still participating but they want these full time, they want full time work. They're gonna get it. Uh, they're getting it. They can continue to command that uh, restructuring from employers who maybe got a little bit used to uh, part time workers so that they could lower their working, their wage bill. Um, that's one area where we do see some uh, increased bargaining power for workers. If you want, a full-time job increasingly you are able to get it that's the fastest recovery in that dimension uh you know it deteriorated hugely during the pandemic and and now it's coming roaring back so very strong labor market uh but you know there's a tension this year between uh firms facing still disrupted supply chains higher input costs and workers facing those higher prices and maybe wanting more compensation so um, will we see some easing in those supply chain frictions? We do see some improvement. We expect that to continue throughout the year. Better labor supply dynamics uh, alongside some cooling in demand because fiscal policy is tightening, because monetary policy is tightening. Um, all of that should serve to cool inflation pressures, um, leaving us uh, with still, I would say, optimism for the possibility of a soft landing. Um, because 
you know, while we've got this policy tightening, we've got a few tailwinds. We still have pent up demand for cars that uh, will, you know, continue to be a support to spending through the year as car production catches up. Um, uh, there's a, a record number of weddings being scheduled for this year, uh, pent up weddings that did not occur during the pandemic. That's a lot of spending that comes with those. Restocking of inventories, which have gotten very lean uh, because of the supply chain frictions, catching up on home building. All of these are tailwinds that should support gro growth even as policy tightens up. Uh, so with that, I will uh, wrap it up with just the conclusion. It's still a highly disrupted economy. Uh, a lot of people still feeling their way for what is a sustainable business model in the new world? What will consumer preferences be? And the outlook is highly uncertain. So uh, we all need to stay on our toes, but um, we should see a pretty decent performance and real growth despite all of these disruptions uh, in 2022. So I will stop there and hand it back to Frank. Thank you very much, Dr. Julia Coronado. And I think on the spot, we need to give Julia the award for smoothest ever Zoom presentation in world history, don't you think? Fantastic. And greetings from the hundreds who have gathered here at the LAEDC Economic Forecast event. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coronado, for uh, joining us here live this morning. And thank you for the presentation from Sanon Sedgwick as well. Economist, thank you again very much. And again, you can review it on the QR code in its entirety. And I have to say, just like the Fed, we go big and go early here at the LAEDC Economic Forecast event. It, Thank you for getting up with the chickens to uh, soar with the eagles who've gathered here this morning. And I don't know about you, but uh, you can never get enough coffee. So we're going to take a, a nice little coffee break and then continue with the program here this morning for uh, 15 minutes. We'll take a break and we will resume the sessions promptly at 945. Infrastructure session will be back in the Bunker Hill Ballroom. The housing session will be in the Hershey Crocker Room. The innovation session will be in the Bradbury Rose Room, and signs will be displayed in front of each room to help guide the guests. Thank you very much, folks, and we'll see you back here shortly. Thank you very much for attending the LAEDC Economic Forecast 2022.
Dr. Hasegaba, if you can come to the AV booth in the back of the ballroom. Dr. Hasegaba in the back of the ballroom. Also, please make your way to your respective breakouts. Those will be starting at 9.50 a.m. sharp. So if you're going to housing or innovation, it will not be in here. It will be in one of the other two rooms. You can ask folks at registration to help direct you. Um, thank you very much, and we'll begin soon. Breakout sessions will begin in four minutes, sharply at 9.50. Breakout sessions will begin very soon, so please make your way and please take your seats if you are going to be uh, sitting in on the infrastructure session. Thank you.
All right, everyone, please take your seats. Breakout sessions are going to begin. Once again, this is the infrastructure ecosystem breakout session. Please take your seats. Please make your way to the front of the room as well for this particular session. We can reconfigure afterwards. If you're going to housing or innovation, uh, please make your way into the foyer and all the way down the halls, you'll find those sessions. All right, and please let's quiet down as we begin. I'm going to pass the mic on over, on over to the Executive Director of the Southern California Association of Governments, Kome Ahise. Thank you, Shane. I'm going to take this off. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the infrastructure session. It's good to have you here. Hello. Thank you. Well, we have a great panel here for you, and I'm hoping that you'll get a chance to uh, entertain them with your questions. But, but before we get to that, I just want to really highlight some things that we heard earlier this morning uh, about the economy. Uh, we felt like, you know, at SCAG, we felt like the same, uh, the same sense of recovery is, is at play. The economy is strong. It's coming back really strong. Uh, there are areas of weakness, obviously, with our housing crisis and also with the pandemic. However, we have this very uh, fortunate sense of, of uh, opportunity that we have with infrastructure funding. And so with me today on this panel are um, a very highly regarded set of folks. Um, I think put together, they probably are responsible for programming amounts of monies that will embarrass any nation on the planet. Uh, and so we want to talk to them and find out what they think about the place of this infrastructure infusion, funding infusion in our economy, uh, how that will play into the recovery, especially as we focus on socioeconomic issues as well as equity issues. And so with that, I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves very briefly. Our panel is very, time is very short. Very briefly, they'll tell you about themselves, what they do, and what they think about this sense of recovery. Stephanie? All right, good morning, Kome. Uh, hello, LA EDC family. My name is Stephanie Wiggins. I'm the new CEO of LA Metro, the third largest transit agency in the country. Um, I, I do feel like we have a golden opportunity with both the, um, the historic infrastructure law as well as the state surplus. So I look forward to the dialogue with my fellow panelists this morning. My name is Charlie Doherty. I'm an economist with Wells Fargo. Uh, one of the things we do is write about how different things that are happening in the economy impact uh, different communities and the overall uh, economic outlook. So I'm excited to be here and thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody. I'm Justin Urbachi. I'm the CEO of Los Angeles World Airports. We are the uh, city department that operates both LAX and Van Nuys airports here in the city. I think many of you know we're undergoing a, a huge uh, capital improvement program uh, that's transforming our airport at LAX. And certainly, um, you know, we are investing over $14.5 billion in that capital program right now, and we've actually just added uh, another huge program that uh, we've embarked on. So infrastructure is very important and look forward to this discussion this morning. Noel. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Noel Hasegaba, and I currently serve as Deputy Executive Director at the Port of Long Beach. I oversee the day-to-day -day administration and operations at the nation's second largest port. You may have heard that we've been a little busier than usual, <laughs> but I look forward to joining my colleagues in this dialogue to talk not just about the near term, but the long term and the great things we can do together given the historic funding that's being made available. So I'm gonna expect that we'll get some questions from all of you, so keep your questions uh, brewing as we, uh, as we speak here. I'm gonna throw a first question at the panel just to, to think through and go directly into this discussion about the infrastructure bill, um, which was passed late last year. Um, this is the largest federal investment that we've ever seen, at least some of us, some of us young ones, uh, that we've ever seen in the, in the history of the country per capita. Um, and through this federal bill, uh, we're placing, there's emphasis on, on creating jobs, sustainability, environmental protection, and equity. So my question is, how do you see, uh, what do you think about this surge of funding and the focus on these three impact areas on the economy? 
me I'll start with start with me. Yeah, always start with the queen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. Um, well, we really see it as a golden opportunity, let me tell you. First of all, uh, with the administration's focus on Justice 40 and equity, we think LA County uh, provides no better example of um, the need to address underserved areas and populations. We think we can be very competitive about that. Um, we have some of the um, lowest income population in the country. And we know that infrastructure, particularly transit infrastructure, can be transformative for those communities. Um, we also um, are, as you know, SCAG, uh, Kome with SCAG better than anyone else. We're in a non-attainment area. And so when we talk about making an impact on climate, um, given the, the emphasis in the infrastructure law on climate reduction strategies, we think LA County is also primed to be a recipient of those funds. And then I will humbly say when it comes to workforce development, whether it's the work that we've done at LA Edo, that we have at LAEDC, um, they've actually uh, conducted studies about Metro's program that forecasts our Measure M program alone will generate over 700,000 direct and indirect jobs, we know that we can be a catalyst for workforce development. Last month marks our 10th year anniversary of our PLA alone. Uh, we have awarded over $8 billion of contracts during that period and really transformed lives and generated thousands, tens of thousands of jobs in the process. So we're very excited about the prospects of highlighting sustainability, workforce development, and economic prosperity. Let me go to Justin. Um, same, same question. How do you see this from your perspective at Lau? So the infrastructure bill, uh, the monies we're going to get are obviously very much welcome. Uh, we are, we are uh, destined to get about $79 million a year over the next five years uh, from an allocation basis at LAX and about $800,000 a year at uh, Van Nuys. Um, and then there's another additional $5 billion uh, that uh, each year you get a section of that that's made available for terminal projects. So for us, it's definitely going to help us, um, but you know, we have, a, as I say, a $14.5 billion program and another six or seven coming, and so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's very welcome, but it's, uh, we, we need a lot more. And what's very important in, in, in spending that money, but all the infrastructure projects that we do uh, two aspects are very important for us, sustainability and inclusivity. So we're making sure that all of the facilities that we're building are sustainable and build with all the sustainable components. And then, of course, making sure that we're offering opportunities to uh, all peoples in Los, in Los Angeles area. And we have several programs in place to be able to do that. Our LAMP program alone, for example, had 17,000 local workers. Uh, working on that project and about 5,600 of those were actually from the communities right around LAX. Um, and so we also have lots of workforce development programs and um, our, probably our biggest uh, program is Hire LAX where we offer um, local residents who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to, to get involved in that with the opportunity to become um, uh, in, involved and get jobs in the construction industry. So it's been a very successful program for us. Well, thanks, Justin. So we've heard land, air. What about sea? So, Noel, you guys have been in focus lately. Uh, how do you see this playing we, out? Yeah, we've certainly been under the spotlight, haven't we? And one of the advantages of that is all the attention that we're getting from our state and federal partners, it's translating into significant infrastructure dollars. Uh, some of you may know that our ports have been severely under, uh, underinvested. In fact, when you look at what's happening on e either coast, uh, West Coast ports, by and large, get about $1 for every $9 invested on the East Coast. And when you look at our neighbors to the north in Canada, uh, the Canadian government has invested over the last 10 years 13 times as much in their port infrastructure. So we have been severely underinvested. So I agree with my colleagues. Uh, I think the stars may be aligning for a transformative opportunity. I agree with. Uh, with Stephanie, it's not just a golden opportunity, it's also a green opportunity because we get to accomplish multiple goals at the, at the same time. In Long Beach, we're proud to be the first green port and we're, we're blazing the trails yet again by pursuing zero emissions technology, zero emissions operations, zero emissions trucks that uh, you'll hear a little bit more about a little later. 
But at the same time, we understand and recognize our role as a massive economic engine, generating uh, more than 800,000 jobs in the city of Long Beach alone, nearly 3 million jobs across the nation. So we want to build on that, we want to capitalize on that, and make sure that our communities that surround us also benefit from the investments made uh, in our port. Now, now, Charlie, I don't want to leave you out of this, uh, because while most of the infrastructure funding directly goes to public type infrastructure expenditure, private sector is not left out of this. And of course, private equity is involved in infrastructure funding. From your perspective as, as a financial institution, what kind of social, um, uh, socioeconomic criteria do you see applying to uh, expenditures that come through, uh, fund, uh, come through financial institutions like yours? Yeah, I, I mean, we have, uh, at Wells Fargo, we have um, a pretty thorough and comprehensive uh, environmental uh, and social risk management framework. Uh, and what that basically entails is doing uh, extra layers of due diligence when it comes to uh, financing different sorts of projects. Um, so what I can tell you is um, environmental and social principles have uh, have risen and I think are, are very important uh, to Wells Fargo, um, you know, not even recently, but over the past 10 or so years. So it's something that we're paying um, a lot of attention to. But overall, what I think this infrastructure bill means uh, for the overall economy, and we heard a little bit about this in the previous presentations uh, with Julie and Shannon, um, this is a, a meaningful, meaningful economic uh, impact because you know we're going to see the fiscal support that we've seen over the past two years roll off the monetary situation is tightening and the infrastructure bill represents a very positive long-term economic plus um, and that goes especially for you know Los Angeles because Los Angeles for being honest has been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic um, as a result it's been um, a little bit slower in its recovery. And I think this massive amounts of spending, not just in the near term, but over the next 10 years, is going to be an extremely positive economic force. Well, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, we'll, we'll take your questions. But as we, uh, there's a mic. Okay, there you go, Shane, thanks. There's a mic going around. But if you, maybe we should take a moment and each one of, especially the public entities here, if you could highlight a project, uh, if you could use a project, this is a curveball, right? Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I know you have like millions <laughs> yeah, of projects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you could highlight a project that you have going on, or could be going on, that will be impacted very substantially and, um, and, and meaningfully in, in, in terms of what funding you see coming at us. It's a jump ball. Who's going to go first? Oh, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so uh, essentially, we have, I think, you know, there are a lot of projects, but the one that I know is a top priority for my board is really transforming um, Southeast LA. It's known as a West Santa Ana branch uh, light rail project. And it's more than a, a, a light rail project. Um, this community, the communities along this alignment, um, have densities of employment and po population uh, five times higher than the LA County average. Um, there are areas of persistent poverty. Um, we have um, a little bit of goods movement uh, along a portion of that alignment. So we um, actually work with the ports um, and Union Pacific along a portion of that corridor. And um, along that alignment, which is primarily manufacturing, it's going, undergoing a quiet evolution and really looking at transforming the high technology types of uh, jobs. And so with a significant investment from the federal government, from this infrastructure law, we really think um, that coupled with contributions from the state, uh, we can really transform that area for the better. Um, this is an underserved community, which is again, top criteria for Justice 40. And when we talk about climate, this is an area where it has a poor air quality. Um, we can transform that area 
for clean air, reduce greenhouse gas emissions with a significant investment for the federal government. The opportunity we have is in the new law, the uh, Capital Investment Grant Program, CIG, it's doubled the amount that's available nationwide, and that is the main grant discretionary program that we rely on for these mega projects. This is a $9 billion mega project with local sales tax. We've identified about $3 billion. So we really see this infrastructure program as the way to transform this community, just like Shannon um, shared earlier, the difference um, these types of transformative investments can make in stimulating a, a local economy for the short and long run. Okay, and, and you said broadband was also an element of this? Well, broadband was mine, yes. Yeah. Broadband will, will be an element as well, yeah, absolutely. All right, Justin? So um, obviously we have a lot of programs going on right now that are transforming, uh, transforming our, our airport, especially LAX. Uh, the most impactful project that we're doing right now would just got to be our landside access modernization project, which involves uh, the implementation of a, uh, an automated people mover train that is going to um, go about two and a quarter miles from the central terminal area where all the terminals are, all the way out to the consolidated, the new consolidated rental car facility that we're developing as part of this project. And this project will really transform the way uh, people access LAX and alleviate a lot of the congestion that we have today. And, and also, of course, the, most importantly, it's going to finally connect the airport with Metro so people can now take public transportation all the way to um, the airport, uh, rail all the way into the, uh, into the airport from anywhere in the city. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the most impactful project that we're working on right now. It's a great project. Noel? Well, first of all, as a frequent traveler, excited about the project at LAX. You know, Comey, your question, you know, pick one project, and we all have many, right? It's like asking me, pick your favorite child. You know, we, we, we love them all, but if there was one that That's I, what we always say. That's <laughs> right. We love them all the same, but if there was yeah. one that, one project that I would use to highlight, it's our Pier Beyond Dock Rail Support Facility. It's a very complex project, and basically what it does for us at the port is it enables us to move more containers directly off the ship onto a train into the hinterland, thereby avoiding uh, truck traffic. And what's exciting about this project, which comes with a price tag of about $1.55 billion, is that this project by itself will more than quadruple uh, the number of rail tracks at the port. That translates into about 7.3 million trucks that will be replaced. Right? Lessening the burden on our inland infrastructure. Uh, our customers love it because it's more efficient, it's faster. Uh, our communities love it because it'll be greener, more sustainable. Think of all the trucks that will be removed from, uh, from the streets. But it's a very complex project. And this is why we're excited about the stars aligning both at the state and federal level because the $17 billion in the infrastructure law, in the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure bill, and the $2.3 billion ports package that's been proposed by the governor are two massive buckets that could help ports like us develop and build these, uh, these projects. That, by the way, will also meet our workforce development needs because these infrastructure projects that have been enumerated here will generate tens of thousands of jobs. So we're very excited about that opportunity. And lastly, uh, we recently received a $52.3 million uh, grant from DOT, uh, part of the PIDP program, that we believe validates how we're approaching this project. Not just developing the infrastructure for congestion relief and sustainability, but also workforce development and our zero emissions quest. Excellent. So these are three great projects that I think are transformative, um, that would definitely have impacts on this region for a long time as they get developed. Now, from your perspective, Charlie, um, how does private equity play into enabling this, this public investments? Um, obviously, you know, public-private investments um, are, are key to, you know, helping a lot of these projects move along. And, and I know, you know, at Wells Fargo, we're just incredibly excited for the opportunity to, you know, assist uh, in any way we can, whether it be, you know, helping out with financing or providing uh, industry expertise in, in any manner of, of area. 
Um, but but I think you know it, I think we're even understating the economic impact here. You know, it's not just tens of thousands of jobs. I think it's going to be millions of jobs over the long term. And this, if you're thinking about equality and lifting, you know, certain communities up, I, I really am a big believer in this type of spending. You know, um, as an economist, we kind of think in in terms of you know multiplier effects and how. You know, a dollar of spending, if that goes out, how much extra dollars or how many jobs that will create. And in just the, the sheer magnitude of this infrastructure bill is just so great. And it's going to, A, lift up the economy in general. The rising tide lifts all boats, we've all heard that before. But the specific types of projects I think that are gonna come as a result are gonna be especially beneficial to some of the you know, lower income um, communities around the country and especially in Los Angeles. So I'm extremely optimistic and I know at Wells Fargo we're extremely excited uh, for these different opportunities. Thanks all. So it's a great start to the panel. I imagine you all have some questions. I knew there was a hand up here uh, earlier on. Uh, two, three hands up. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Shanae. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so this is a really great panel, and my question- If you could also just state your name so we know who you are and where you, and your, uh, just your affiliation so the panel is a little yeah. bit familiar. Sure, uh, Shanae Rourke, um, I'm on the executive committee of the LAEDC, that's the hat I'm representing today. Um, I know that the Metro Board, and this is for all the panelists, I know the Metro Board had recently moved forward a motion that was approved for 48 by 28 under um, Ms. Wiggins' leadership. We really applaud her for that, and I think it's a very strong message. So my question is really, if she could talk a little bit more about that, and then I'd like to ask the other panelists uh, from a corporate side, corporation, as well as other public agencies, if they'll be taking, um, following the leadership of Ms. Wiggins in Metro. Okay. That's, that's thanks, all Shanae. Yours. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Shanae. I think it's a great transition from Charlie's answer because he talked about the exponential benefits of the infrastructure dollar investment. Well, our 48 by 28 aspirational initiative is an example of this. And essentially what we've set out is a goal in alignment with the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games to increase uh, the percentage of um, procurement dollars awarded to small businesses to 48% by 2028. And it's an exciting goal. Um, today we're averaging about 28% on our entire por portfolio. Um, but we think it's important because we know that small businesses hire more people. We know that it's a way to really uh, stimulate the local economy. And we know, to Charlie's point, that particularly in LA County, small businesses have disproportionately been negatively impacted by the pandemic. So if we talk about a role that we can play in helping um, accelerate an equitable recovery, we think there's no better way that, to do that than with our small businesses. So on top of that, we're also coming forward with a local preference policy uh, for small businesses as, as well. But what we know for sure is that in uh, engaging in what we call inclusive procurement policy, it's not a handout. We get better quality work, we get competition on price, and um, we actually help stimulate the local economy. So it's a triple bottom line positive for us, and that's why our board has doubled down in light of the opportunities with the Olympics. You all gonna follow? Justin's sure. doing great things over Lala. <laughs> sure, yeah. we're, we're um... It doesn't have to be exactly the same thing, but the, the sense of how, how is small business playing into your program? Small, business, small businesses are a very, very important part of what we do, small local businesses. Um, and we, we have very uh, strong inclusivity procurement guidelines that we've implemented uh, so that uh, there are um, very strong requirements around meeting certain um, percentages of small and local business in, in, in any procurement that we do. We also have implemented new contractual uh, language to make sure that, that those uh, goals are, those targets are not just aspirational, but they're actually are contractual so that there's teeth to them and we can hold people accountable and it costs them money uh, if they don't meet them. 
Um, but uh, just as important is uh, all of our programs to try to help small and local businesses to be able to understand how to participate in getting these opportunities at, uh, with all the projects that we're doing. So we have uh, our Build LAX program where we're helping, giving programs uh, in place for small and local businesses to help them understand how they can certify themselves, how they can participate in opportunities uh, to work at LAX. And uh, of course, again, our, our whole um, uh, stress to have a certain amount of the jobs be local uh, on each of, of, our, of our projects as well. So we have uh, inclusivity uh, and is a very, very important part of everything we do in all of our projects. Yeah, and I, and I would also add, and I appreciate the question, uh, at the Port of Long Beach, we're definitely aligned with LAX and Metro. In fact, we have a long history as a port authority of trying to get our the overall share of small and very small business uh, uh, contracts uh, to go up. In fact, we started with a goal of over 10 years ago of 25%. We're up to close to 30%. But it goes beyond that. Uh, we're also trying to amplify our outreach efforts to, to veterans. Uh, just recently, in the last year and a half, we've also amplified our efforts to try to make these contract opportunities to uh, minority-owned businesses and targeting uh, historically disadvantaged communities. In fact, uh, just in the last couple of months, uh, Port of Long Beach was selected as one of five entities across the nation on a national initiative that will um, uh, put together a template or a model to make sure that a lot of these infrastructure investments that translate into multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar contracts are accessible by, by small businesses. Our excellent response is, <clears throat> we know that, you know, by making sure there's diversity and inclusion in, in our program and beyond just small businesses, but to also minority businesses, that we can in fact expand opportunities to the tune. I think it was a McKinsey report that said we can grow the GDP to you know, about two or three billion, trillion dollars uh, by ha having all inclusive um, uh, economy uh, in, in this country. So, so there is a lot of uh, morality involved in doing what we're doing, but there's also economic sense in doing what we're doing. Great question. Uh, the next question. Okay, I, I'm gonna, Shane's gonna be the controller. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hand back there as well and front and in front here. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Tarosis. I'm Supervisor Holly Mitchell, Senior Deputy for Economic Development. Thank you all for what you're doing. Hi, Shanae. I have a question around jobs. So I think we've thought a lot about the at the county, you know, we contract out for about $6 billion of goods and services annually. And we obviously know LAX, the ports, Metro, are contracting out. So what are we doing to ensure local diverse folks are getting into the actual jobs that we are creating through our contracts? Are we thinking about putting any sort of job standards in our contracts when we contract out these dollars? That sounds like a public, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to take that for ours. So, and, and I think that um, our colleagues all have the same types of procedures, but we, we put um, percentages uh, that, they, that when people propose in jobs that they have to meet as far as how many, uh, what percentage of the contracts, uh, the money goes to small local businesses, disadvantaged veterans, uh, and also local jobs. So we, we put these all in the procurements that people have to meet these or exceed them. And what we've done is also is not only we don't want them just to meet it, we want to give them extra points to the extent that they exceed it and, uh, and their programs that they propose to us are not only meeting that, but it's also how they're going to meet it and how they're going to uh, put programs in place to make sure that they're helping local small businesses. So we put these into procurements and people have to meet those. And then again, we've put in their contracts that uh, require them to meet those uh, in, in, in the project or they're, or they're in default of their contract or we assess penalties normally. And, and we follow a very similar approach, almost identical to what Justin described at the Port of Long Beach. And again, when we started this uh, over 10 years ago, our initial target was 20%. These days we're hovering around 30%. And with our participation in this national initiative, we're very excited about the prospects of moving the needle yet again and making these uh, multi-billion dollar contract opportunities to entities that in the past perhaps did not have access to or, or were not eligible for, and very excited to continue to uh, continue that work. Yeah, we know most jobs are created by small businesses, so having, 
having that um, opportunity to compete uh, on, on public contracts, I think is very important. And we've seen the DBE, uh, MBE programs grow over time and, and targets set beyond what the federal state limits are. So that's very encouraging. Um, I think there's a hand back there and then the gentleman in front here will be next. Hi, my name is Stephanie Holloway and I work with the LA County's Economic and Workforce Development. Um, I actually was going to ask a very similar question as to Carolyn, but I'll take it a step further in the sense of community impact. So one, how do you work with the local workforce development boards to actually, you know, um, layer on top of the investments that are currently happening on high road training partnerships, um, sort of some of the um, onboarding to focus on specific target populations like uh, justice evolved individuals, homelessness, um, because I think a lot of what we're seeing is that we're trying to partner with some of these, you know, infrastructure part projects, but we're not really kind of getting that connection happening. So that's one. The other thing is um, a lot of these investments are sort of happening in communities, as you said, that are you know, um, historically underrepresented. Um, but what are we doing to in your projects to actually make sure that housing displacements aren't happening? that the communities aren't feeling the negative impacts of these infrastructures coming through their communities. Yeah, I know Stephanie is ready for that one. Um, I, and if you, just, if you just, Stephanie, think about how we could use this one-time opportunity funds to change the, the dynamic of inequities that we see, especially targeting populations that usually are not represented in the workforce. Sure. A um, couple of things. So working with workforce development boards, we actually did that at Metro when we developed our Workforce Initiative Now LA program, which is really to um, encourage hiring, uh, local hiring of our procurements outside of construction because we have our uh, local hiring opportunities on our construction projects through our project labor agreements with our trades. And that's worked wonderfully, as I stated earlier. But about five years or so ago, we worked with local workforce development boards to develop this new program that would really look at the rest of the portfolio of job opportunities, both with our contractors and consultants, where they are actually given uh, bonus points on their evaluation as to their commitment to hire locally under our Win LA program, as well as internally to Metro. Um, so we've been more intentional about that recently, actually just last week. We just submitted um, an application at the federal level for a room to work program where we are intentional in targeting unhoused individuals, partnering with homeless outreach providers who also include wraparound services to, um, or for circumstances when they contact those individuals on our system, they provide them uh, housing, we are guaranteeing uh, a job for up to two years as a career pathway. So we're really excited about our Room to Work program, um, and that's a, uh, working with the community, homeless outreach providers, and others on that concept. You talked about housing. Housing is critically important. We have a joint development policy that focuses on affordable housing, minimizing uh, displacement and gentrification, and that has been met with some success. And then I'll just close with, um, Conway's question about with this one-time funding, how can we be, be transformative given your question, Stephanie? I want to uplift a partnership that we have going on with the county right now that we'd love LAEDC to be partners with us as well, and that is um, developing a transportation technology center of excellence. And what that means at its um, most succinct point is bringing U.S. Rail, manufact rail manufacturing back to the U.S. Today, uh, across the nation, there are no rail cars that are ma manufactured in the United States. We know that in L.A. County alone, because of the voters, we're going to be ordering over 900 rail cars just in the next 10 years. That's us alone. We know there are plenty of other customers. Partnering with um, the county and actually LAWA, we've identified a potential 20-acre site where we could, uh, working with the private sector, Charlie, we could develop this um, industrial park so we could bring manufacturing here to LA County, here to the US, and start growing um, a workforce that is trained in this technology, 
um, that is sustainable. And what we need is this one-time investment at the federal level. It's about $2 billion, but that's the type of transformation that can happen when we take into account workforce development, um, demands for the industry, and then working with our county and economic partners to develop a plan. Thank you for that response. Uh, Charlie, what, what, what do you see from the private sector perspective? Because I, oftentimes we always think of the private sector as just profit <laughs> and loss, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you all are more than that. Uh, there's a lot of social responsibility on the private sector side, uh, more than is reported. Uh, how do you see that? How do you see that playing out in this conversation we're talking about with diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's um, a bottom line aspect to, to everything we're talking about, but of course there's the, um, uh, the just the way we recognize that corporations, you know, are more than just, you know, profits and, and losses and, and things like that. And, and corporations, not just Wells Fargo, but everybody, um, you know, plays a significant role uh, in our community. Um, and, you know, providing jobs, providing financing, providing economic opportunity is just, you know, so vitally important, and I think. Um, and I think the time to be you know, passive with a lot of these things it has, you know, is over. And I think the aggressive targeting of some of the more impacted communities and more directing more investment to some of these areas is just so um, important, not just from a social um, uh, sort of, of thing, but you, just in terms of the economy as well, because um, it, it's not good enough anymore to have you know, a certain segment of the population doing well and a certain segment not doing well. You know, when you could have everybody doing well. So finding new and creative ways to sort of make that happen, I think, uh, you know, is just so important. And I think um, it's gonna receive a whole lot more attention in the years ahead. You have a question here? Absolutely, thanks so much. Jermaine Hampton, uh, Director of Workforce Development with LAEDC. Um, so really a comment and a question. So, so on one side, um, you know, we're developing a infrastructure workforce council. So definitely want to um, intertwine and get you all involved in that. Um, the flip side to that is uh, challenges. Um, what challenges have you had in terms of talent pipelines coming from the community colleges, the universities, um, in particular our American job centers throughout the LA region? Um, what challenges have there been from an educational standpoint um, putting, you know, individuals into career pathways, et cetera. Um, could you just speak to that a little bit? Thank you. You want to start with that, Justine? Yeah, sure. So challenges we have uh, most recently is the challenges everybody is having, and that is just getting people who want to work. Uh, and, you know, we are, we are trying to, to hire in certain areas, and we just can't find people that um, are taking these types of jobs, mainly around maintenance, uh, areas and also security, so police and, and security officers. But in general, one of the things that we're trying to um, tackle with workforce development, and we've done a lot in the construction area, and we're, you know, we need to continue to do that, but we, we also, in, in just in the general aviation uh, area, we, we need to do a lot more, and we're looking to try to find who we can partner with to be able to find programs like we have Hire LAX for construction. We want to do the same type of thing for people, to get people educated in the area of aviation and all the different aspects to aviation. Uh, because we just don't have anywhere to go to to find people who have this type of expertise or experience or training. And so uh, that's, a, that's an area that we're working on especially right now. Yeah, we certainly have not been immune to the great resignation. Um, some of you have seen the footage of ships queuing up right out, outside the ports and containers piling up inside the terminals. And one of the reasons for that is because of a worker shortage, either at the warehouses, distribution centers, or even on the trucking side. Uh, we had a truck driver shortage before the pandemic, and it was certainly magnified as a result of the pandemic. So we have a lot of work to do in the goods movement sector altogether. Um, and that's why workforce development is so critical. And, and this is why we're talking about infrastructure and workforce development all in the same breath, along with sustainability and equity. And I'm just so glad that we're finally approaching some of these social problems 
as connected, because that's exactly what we must do to maximize the full effects of these uh, historic dollars. And let me also add that it's historic not just because of the, the, the amounts of dollars, but the way in which our federal and state partners are doling them out. You know, in the old days, it used to be everyone gets a little bit, no one got enough. Uh, this time around, everyone's trying to be a little more thoughtful, a little more intentional. And I really believe that workforce development has to be at the center of that. Uh, one of the projects that we're very proud of in the ports of LA Long Beach is this Goods Movement Workforce Training Campus that we're developing in partnership with the ILWU PMA. That represents uh, the, the initiative that's going to be that inflection point that will get us ready to support uh, the workforce of the future. If we want a green future, we also need to prepare the workforce to be able to operate the equipment that's going to get us there. So it's all interrelated, and I appreciate your question. So time is winning for us on the panel here, uh, and we can feel it because we can see it down here. Um, we can take one more question, but while the question is being, uh, while you're thinking about a question, I'm going to ask the panelists to think about, because we're going to come back to all, all four of you, to think about one takeaway you would want to leave with this attendees today about the opportunities that are ahead of us. Uh, what is the one takeaway you think this potential of this one-time funding and the opportunity uh, ahead of us looks like uh, from your perspective? We'll take that one last question and we might have a quick response to that. Thank you. I'm, I'm Barry Waite with the Carson Chamber of Commerce. And uh, so I run local hire programs and I know it's way harder than it looks. Um, I just wanted to lift up a success in that area, which is uh, LA Unified School District's program. I was on the Bond Oversight Committee for years, and uh, their program has been successful because they start from the ground up. So they, uh, they recruit people as workers, they nurture them as supervisors, they help them start their own businesses, and they have a pipeline of projects for them. So it's really hard to do local hire for one project. But when you have the stream of them, like your agencies do, it seems to work. So um, I would suggest looking at that model and, and let's, uh, let's go off of their successes because otherwise, it's, frankly, it's just a lot of window dressing and you don't really have anything at the end of it. So let's do what we can do to nurture those from the ground up. Thanks. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's another way to diffuse innovation. Uh, we're going to start with Noel first. One takeaway. I would say that we're at the cusp of a new industrial revolution, and we have a short time window to get it right. We can't afford not to get it right. And I think uh, what's going to be at the center of this is going to be collaboration, making sure that all the entities represented here, plus the private sector, that when, as we plan out our infrastructure investments, our strategic investments, that we're talking to each other and we have the bigger picture in hand. And I'll give you just one very brief example, zero emissions. If I asked you how many of you are in this room for zero emissions, I think everyone would raise their hands, right? There's a lot of collaboration that, need, that we need to get there. Uh, and we have to do it in a way that's least disruptive, that doesn't break the bank, uh, that trains and prepares the workforce for the future. So I would say collaboration is going to be key. Justin? So the, the I mean, this, this focus on infrastructure and the money being put into it from, from an airport's perspective is, um, is helping, is really helping to uh, make up for the many, many, many years that there was a lack of investment in, air, in airport infrastructure. And we as, a, as a U.S. and U.S. airports are suffering as a result of that because we're way behind the rest of the world as far as the infrastructure in our airports. So this is giving us an opportunity to really invest the money that we need. It's, it's not nearly enough, honestly. Uh, it's definitely a help, and we, we look forward to try to get, get even more to, to, uh, to help us do this. But we're desperately in need of, a, of investments in our airports, and we are taking advantage of this opportunity, and the money is available to really uh, put uh, infrastructure, make infrastructure investments at LAX and Van Nuys that are really going to transform our airports and make them into the airports that, that Angelinos deserve for this great city. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a great time right now, and uh, we have a very ambitious program to transform our airports. Thank you. Charlie. Yeah, um, you know, there's been relatively few things to get excited for over the past two years. Uh, and, and I think 
the opportunity that the infrastructure bill presents uh, is legitimately extremely exciting and I'm very optimistic about the long-term economic impacts here. Because remember, as you just mentioned, you know, we haven't been spending a lot of money on infrastructure over the past two or three decades. In fact, if you look at spending on infrastructure as a percent of the overall economy or as, uh, or as a percent of GDP, it's been flat to even declining. So as we all know, you know, infrastructure investment is vitally important uh, in terms of connectivity, in terms of getting people to their jobs, in, in terms of uh, bridging different communities. So I'm incredibly optimistic uh, about you know, where these various infrastructure projects will be headed and the overall positive economic impact that they will have. Okay, bring us home, Stephanie. I would just say uh, my takeaway would be um, if we want to really optimize this opportunity that we all collectively have before us, status quo will not work. Mm -hmm. If we want to realize the quality of life benefits, if we want to do the collaboration, we've got to change the way we communicate and coordinate and think about these projects. Earlier, um, Kome mentioned in relation to our West Santa Ana project, broadband. He's right. We're gonna work with SCAG and the county and look at our projects on both the highway and the transit side to see, can we also incorporate broadband and help contribute to closing that digital divide? Whether it's partnering with the city of Inglewood on the Inglewood People Mover or LAWA over um, their connections to the airport. Critically, because these projects, we didn't talk about it, but these projects are increasingly exorbitantly expensive. If we wanna really be intentional with the money and exponentially have benefits, um, we need to make sure we don't follow the status quo. Absolutely. Well, I wanna thank the panel for uh, their insights this morning. I think you've had a chance to listen to just a snippet of the potential that's before us. Um, if anything, I hope you're optimistic about the future, but more than anything, I hope you feel responsible for the stewardship obligation that comes with this tremendous opportunity that we have uh, with this one-time funding. So with that, please give my panelists a round of applause and thank you all for spending time with us. And you have about 10 minutes until thank we begin our final <laughs> session. So please okay. utilize this time to check Good out work, the exhibitors, guys. grab some food and well drink, well take a thank little uh, restroom Good break, job. and we'll see you back at 10.45. Oh, they want a panel photo. Okay. Panel photo, great. Okay. And closing plenary panelists and moderator, if you can meet me in the back by the AB booth, AV booth. Uh, closing plenary panelists and moderators, please meet me in the back by the AV booth. Thank you.
Five minutes until we begin our closing plenary. Five minutes, and we will begin. Closing plenary session will begin in three minutes. Closing plenary will begin in three minutes. Please take your seats.
90 seconds until we begin the closing plenary. Please take your seat. 90 seconds. Please take your seat. Closing plenary beginning in 30 seconds. Please take your seats. We are beginning in 30 seconds. Please everyone take your seats and please welcome back to the stage our amazing MC for today, Frank Motek. All right, well thank you very much, voice of God, we do appreciate it. Folks, please take your seats for the final part of our program today. We're just about to get started once again. A lot of uh, moving and shaking going on out there right now with the uh, movers and shakers, the biggest names in business here in the Los Angeles area present with us here uh, today. It's great to meet uh, many of you, including uh, Justin Urbachi, the CEO of LA World Airports. Uh, wonderful to speak with you. And Ms. Wiggins from Metro. My goodness, Ron Frierson is here, Director of Economic Policy for the Mayor's Office of Economic Development. Michael Rowland from the Senate of the Economy. Of course, uh, other folks from the Port of Long Beach as well as the Ports of Los Angeles. Ivy Arias, congratulations on your new firm, Brand LA. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention as we are about to resume the program. What a great day. And again, thank you so much, Bill Allen, for bringing us all together. It's been a fantastic experience throughout this entire morning being able to greet each other in person. And, and Stephen Chung will see you up here in uh, just a few moments. So thank you very much. And welcome back, everyone. Hope everyone is uh, recaffeinated and ready to go for the final part of the program. Hope you've enjoyed the powerful insights from the breakout sessions and innovation, infrastructure, and housing. And uh, get a chance to catch up uh, with a lot of friends here on the business scene. Now it's an honor to introduce to you the moderator for the closing plenary session, Aaron Osman. Aaron Osman currently works as the U.S. leader for the Education to Workforce team in the Global Public Sector Division of Amazon Web Services. In this role, Aaron Osman leads a team of workforce experts who assist state education and workforce leaders to design and implement workforce readiness programs that will prepare their students for future cloud careers. Before Amazon, he served as the Vice President and General Manager of the Certiport Division of Pearson from 2012 to 2020, where he led the Global Career and Technical Education Division. And from 91 to 2012, he built his expertise in IT education and workforce enablement through key leadership roles at WordPerfect, Novell, and Microsoft. He also served as a Utah State Senator from March of 2011 through January of 2016, and during his term, he served on the Public Education Appropriations Committees and the Higher Education Appropriations Committee. He also served as a chair of the Public Education Standing Committee and then as chair of the Economic Development and Workforce Committee. Sounds like we've got the right guy here, folks. Please welcome Aaron Osmond.
a lot. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be here today on behalf of Amazon Web Services. I want to thank the LAEDC very much for the opportunity to be involved and sponsor this important discussion. Uh, you might be wondering, why is a guy, a white guy from Utah here talking about these important topics going on here in California? I get that. And I hope that you'll see from this session today why we care at Amazon so much about this discussion. The, the appropriate and future use of, um, of federal funds that are coming to help stimulate economic development in a diverse and equitable way. So we're excited to talk about this today. I want to share that the, the session today is really about we have all these funds coming in from the EDA and Build Back Better and even SURF related funds that are being allocated into the state. And we really want to have a representation from the community, from business and government, these different ecosystems that interact together, you can't separate them. They interact together in the successful utilization of that funding. And we're gonna hear from some experts today that really have that context about how these funds could be and should be used in the most effective way to drive economic growth and resiliency in the communities of California. So I wanna introduce our panelists and invite them up to the stage. I wanna have all three of you just come on up. I'll read some little information about each of you as you guys come up. First of all, Tokes Omoshakin, who is recently, just on Monday, was announced by the governor as the new Secretary of Transportation. We'd like to welcome Tokes to the, to the stage with us. He's been managing the Caltrans system, but is now in a much broader, comprehensive role. We congratulate him and give him some condolences for the burden and pressure that he's facing. Um, we also want to welcome Gustavo Velasquez, who is the director of the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Many of you may know that he actually served as an assistant secretary at the HUD in, back in the DC and has just a lot of experience about economic development in the context of housing. And then we have Tracy Gray, who is, the founding, who is the founder and managing partner of the fund, 22 Fund, which is an early growth equity firm with a mission of growing intergenerational wealth and creating clean, quality jobs of the future by increasing global competitiveness, especially for women in BIPOC. We're so excited to have her perspective from, the, from that context as well. And so please welcome our panel for this session today. Okay, panel, I wanna, I wanna get started by talking about these three ecosystems. The first is infrastructure, innovation, and housing. And they all have you know, great potential. They're, they're rooted in equity and sustainability and resilience for the economy of California. But before we start talking about how federal funds that are coming in impact these areas, I'd like to get your perspectives, all three of you, about why you believe your specific ecosystem is central to economic development in that context. Let's start with you, Gustavo. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and share the stage with such esteemed colleagues. Um, well, as the housing market goes, the economy goes. I mean, if we all remember the tragic events of 2007, 2008, when Wall Street was playing monkey business with financial instruments that were pumping so much money into the housing market and that started a, a, a events that uh, were tragically evolved into the, one of the worst financial crises of a generation. And uh, the issue, the biggest issue here is that we cannot have a vibrant economic recovery if the housing market is not economic, uh, recovering as well. Uh, McKinsey estimates uh, in about $140 billion economic output losses because of the shortage of housing in the state of California. That's $140 billion annually. So it is very, very important that we ensure that we have a vibrant housing market in terms of the supply of housing. It's making sure that we have enough supply of housing we are doing better looking at the last quarter, the last couple of quarters, but it's still uh, the issue of supply is crushing uh, many people, especially low-income people, people of color, minorities. Uh, here in LA County, 78% of extremely low-income families pay more than 50% of their income in housing. In order for a person to afford the average rental asking price, you have to earn in LA County $39 an hour. So when we think of economic recovery, we have to think about the availability of housing that will improve the affordability 
and accessibility of housing across all communities, across all neighborhoods. This is very much tied to also where housing is available, ties to sectors like transportation and innovations in technology, the types of housing that we are creating, but certainly housing shortages has to improve in California. We, uh, without availability and affordability of housing, we are not going to have an inclusive economic recovery, and we're not going to have overall inclusive prosperity across all our communities. Thank you. Tokes? Yeah, good, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, Aaron, I too was wondering what a white guy from Utah <laughs> was, uh, was doing at this We'll event. talk more about it later. Okay, yeah, I, I need to understand that a little bit more, but uh, kudos and congratulations to LAEDC for uh, hosting this successful event. I think a very important conversation to have in the midst of what's about to happen to us, the opportunity that's presenting itself to us as a nation, as a state, and as, as a community. But Aaron, to your, to your question about why transportation in particular is so, mm -hmm. is so important, I truly believe that transportation, but to your question, is the center, the center most important part of quality of life and livability, period. So you could argue education, how important it is to us uh, as humans. You could argue healthcare, access to healthcare. Uh, but when you think about it, what's at the middle of us being able to have any kind of upward mobility? Access to transportation. Access to transportation. Mm -hmm. Quality transportation. Not just being able to drive a car, but across the board. Yeah. Whether it be buses, rail, walking, biking, whatever it is, it is at the center. If you look at all the countries that have had any kind of success, uh, lately in economic growth, it's because they have focused on investing in this. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, start, let's start off with Maslow's Law of Hierarchy, <laughs> if we can go back to school days. <laughs> uh, psychological needs. Yeah. Is one of, it's the foundation, it's the absolute foundation of what he says we as humans need to have any kind of success in life. And under that, he talks about clothing, talks about shelter, doesn't mention transportation, but it's a part of that. It's a part of that need. The, the biggest example, what I believe is the largest economic revitalization experiment that's ever been done in the world, I believe it's China. In 1981, in 1981, China's poverty level was 88%, almost 90%, nine zero. Today, it's less than 5%. A big part of why they were able to do that is because they started to invest in infrastructure, invest in technology, and invest in transportation specifically. Today, in the early 80s, they had no miles of high-speed rail, as in not. Today, over 23,000 miles of high-speed rail in China. Now, you could argue about what kind of um, uh, political structure or governmental structure yeah. they have and how that's, it's not the best, but they've been able to pull their people up, up out of poverty mm -hmm. uh, in a mere 40 years. It is, the work that we're doing is at the center of being able to lift people up and give people opportunity in this country um, and in this state and in this region. So we have a great opportunity in front of us, a huge opportunity in front of us with this infrastructure bill, the largest investment that the country's ever set for over a five-year period uh, to, to uh, lift people out of op uh, poverty and, and give more opportunity to people in an equitable form. Impactful, thank you. Yeah. Tracy, what about from an innovation perspective? Um, well, thank, first, thanks to LADC and Bill. It's been a while since seeing you. Seen every, and thanks for everyone not going to the parade. Um, <laughs> it's great to see faces that I haven't seen in a long time. I don't recognize everybody with their longer hair and smaller or bigger bodies. Um, but it's great to be here. So um, I think innovation. I'm going to see your housing and your transportation and raise you innovation on what's <laughs> important um, to stay with an analogy of the time. Innovation is 
it, it's not a siloed ecosystem. It surrounds each of your ecosystems, and it's a, like a virus, <laughs> and it's in everything. And that's the way we have to look at the capital that is coming from the government. We have to leverage it to use more innovative ways, technology to improve the efficiency of housing, the efficiency of transportation, how we build it faster, how we can lower the cost of housing. Um, innovation is everywhere. So I don't know how you could ever separate innovation from anything. The, um, and that especially is clean technologies and that address climate change. That, that has to run horizontal through everything we are doing. And so since the money, all money is fungible. Yeah. And as a venture capitalist, we know how to do that, right? <laughs> we know how to move money around um, to fit whatever needs. At the time, um, the bill, I, I actually looked at Brookings had a, um, a chart on how the money is spent. And then it had columns that, one of them was climate, and there's like a bunch of no, 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 no on different um, areas, and then a few yeses. And I was like, oh, that's not really looking at the way you should look at climate. If you look at it in the correct way, where it's not political, it should be a yes through every line item of the infrastructure bill. Innovation should be a yes on every line item of the infrastructure bill. And equity should be a line item at every point in the, in the bill. So the way I look at, quote, ecosystem um, of innovation, if you take the Silicon Valley or Silicon Beach or Silicon Alley or whatever Silicon in the country, um, it's very insular. You know, it looks like you. Um, insular. <laughs> you know, it looks like white guys, you know, but if you really think innovative, the ecosystem should look like all of us, and that's not happening right now. So um, to tackle the issues around housing, wouldn't it be smart to give the people who live in housing that isn't at the best and have them innovate around what we need? Is it better to have transportation where the people who use buses and not the people from above saying you should drive a, you know, take a train or what have you, and have them innovate, give them the tools, the capital to improve these other ecosystems. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. But on. you asked me, and I said I won't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just pivot to. I'll what keep I was... trying, Tracy. I'll get you to <laughs> okay. say. Okay. So I'm, I hope I answered. That was your great. Okay. That was great. Let's talk about trends, and I'll give you an example. Um, at Amazon Web Services, we're seeing cloud is fundamentally changing every industry, every business. It's enabling equity and access to small businesses to compete with Fortune 500. And it's also creating huge problems in the workforce because we just can't find the talent to fill the technical jobs that are needed to support our growth. Similar kinds of trends are affecting each one of you in your ecosystems. Let's start with you, Gustavo. How, what trends are you seeing from an economic impact, economic development impact in housing? One of the things where housing intersects so well with transportation innovation is something that California actually is doing well. It's leading the nation, which is the fight against climate change. Housing accounts for about uh, one-fifth of the gas, uh, the harmful gas emissions. We know transportation, unfortunately, is the number one cause of that. But, but, but. Thanks, Gustavo, thanks. But it, it, is, it is becoming a bigger problem for buildings, residential units. In fact, across the country, multifamily buildings and single family homes combined represent the six emitter of harmful gas emissions on the planet for the U.S. housing market. So we have to do better, and there are two ways in which California is leading the way. First, the innovations in how housing is being built now. So, you know, the revolution of uh, green building is with us. 
the innovations in manufactured housing, the innovations in modular housing mm -hmm. that are having a great effect in the um, decarbonization of the housing sector. Uh, the push towards electrification, which is the same way we're seeing it in transportation, we're seeing it now in housing, and the governor is resolute to advance in California towards those objectives of decarbonizing transportation sector, housing sector, just a lot of innovation in the field. But the other is where we are creating new housing opportunities. Uh, this is an issue where the state has to partner with local jurisdictions to make sure that we focused on uh, the creation of housing in infill sites, denser sites, closer to job, closer to the center of economic activity, and not so much so far away uh, in, in, and it's happened that way because if you go farther away from the urban core, that's where you're going to pay less for housing, but that ha comes at a tremendous cost right. to the environment, a tremendous cost in commuting times. So we have to ensure that housing focuses on uh, um, uh, areas that reduce vehicle miles travel, focuses <laughs> on infill. Uh, I think this is a, an opportunity in the economic sector where, where things are really evolving and it can create tremendous output in construction, in goods and services. Everything that a home has to be included, included with has to be uh, a, focused on innovations in the fields that are focused on the green economy. And I think California is really on a path on improving uh, tremendously in, 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 in yeah. this area. Yeah. Fantastic insights. Thank you. Talks, so what are your thoughts on the transportation side? So, you know, I've, I've been around the transportation space for roughly 20 years. I heard my friend uh, Comey say on the last panel, this is a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity in front, in front of us. Uh, the biggest thing that I'm seeing as far as a trend is we're getting the money, yeah. finally. Yeah. We're getting the money. So in 2017, California passed SB1. It's putting $5 billion annually towards transportation, additional revenue that the state's never had. The governor's budget this year, January of this year, $9 billion is being proposed for transportation. Roughly half of that is going to, is being proposed to go to high-speed rail. We're getting the federal money on the highway side at Caltrans alone. Our budget over five-year period was roughly $20 billion. We're going to be getting $25 billion. So money, money, money like we've never seen. Uh, the Caltrans budget this year, our annual budget, is going to be over $20 billion for the first time in its history. We're going to be north of $20 billion. But the biggest trend and the most important trend as a part of the money is the fact that policy is finally connecting to the resources. And it's never happened like this before. It's always one or the other. If you go back in history, it's, we got a lot of good policy, but where's, where's the money? Or the other way around. You got money, but the direction that we're going as a nation, you're, you're saying, what in the world? We're not hitting the key issues. We're not hitting on the things that are the most important. Finally, I believe we're there. Um, issues around climate, issues around equity, and transportation specifically, issues around safety, are finally at the center of how we're doing our work. Those are the foundational principles of Caltrans today. Safety, equity, and climate action. That's what every, all of our work is done through that lens. So we're finally at a place where we can say, look, we're gonna, we believe we're gonna make uh, some, some headway. We're gonna make some dividends. We're gonna pay some dividends uh, out of uh, all the work that's been, been going on uh, uh, for many years. And, and the trend is a lot of, as you could tell from the prior panel, or yeah. I only saw the prior panel, but a lot of cities, uh, county governments, state governments are trying to do the same thing. They're focused on the same, uh, same issues and not just giving lip service to how important these issues are. So uh, an incredible period in front of us. I, I love the comment about policy aligning with the funding, that it's a very unique time in history mm -hmm. and we need to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Tracy, your thoughts? Your question was about workforce. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, so if you look at from a sector approach to solving problems, um, what we found out during the pandemic is how important manufacturing 
is to our economy. It is literally the foundation of our economy. When we were, you know, held up in our houses during the pandemic and couldn't get enough PPE and other stuff, and then when we have the supply chain problem, this is all comes from where the manufacturing is located. What a lot of people don't know is Southern California, I think it still does, the last I looked, is the number one manufacturing center in the country, more than all of Michigan combined. But we can't, um, we have 2.4 million jobs unfilled in the manufacturing sector in the country from a lack of skills. Exactly. So our workforce development organizations are not keeping up. And that impacts both of you because the um, supplies you need to build are different than they were in the past. And they're built either from robotics, there's some AI involved. So um, technology is not killing jobs, it's changing jobs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are not upskilling the workforce Fascinating. because manufacturing right now, you need at least, you just need eighth grade analytical skills. Mm -hmm. So we need to start thinking about that when it comes to workforce and digital education for workforce development needs to be infused in manufacturing. Um, I think I said like just in time, just doesn't work anymore, right? It's not gonna work anymore. We have to shore up the inventory of manufacturers, but they can't do that because there's no capital for them, for working capital and inventory. They usually, it's usually, it, their capital is um, because of a PO they have. They build that, but they can't hire more people. Um, and then we need to teach our manufacturers also how to export more. Our country is a consumer-based economy, and we think we're going to spend ourselves out of every problem we have. <laughs> we can't do that. Right. We have to sell ourselves out of these problems, and that is exports. And unfortunately, along with manufacturing and trade are the two areas that most people don't understand. <laughs> and that includes the people who say where money goes. So, you know, I, my company invests in manufacturing to increase their export capacity. We do that because it creates jobs faster. And when you couple manufacturing with exports, the jobs pay on average 94,000 a year, which means you can afford the housing, you can afford the transportation. Manufacturing is in low and moderate income communities, which means they are closer to their jobs and they can get paid a lot more more likely to have health care. So we have to look at where, you know, I'm talking about the private sector right now. We have to look at where capital goes in the private sector around innovation. It went to a lot of, a lot of those companies that the uh, forecast had said left California, they all got government money. And then they, then they start that whole mean thing we say is everyone's leaving California. Well, whatever, let them leave, but we can build up manufacturing to have a lot of small and medium-sized companies instead of just big Fortune 500s that as soon as the tax goes, goes up somewhat, they're like, we're out. You can't move manufacturing that fast. So they're gonna stay. It's just like the service industry, you can't move hotels really quickly. So that, that industry stays, but it, you know, it doesn't run a hotel, it doesn't pay enough for a lot of people, women and people of color. So we just have to think about going circular. This is how I have conversations. I it. <laughs> <laughs> it's circular. Money is fungible. That money coming from the government where it says it's for transportation, where there's, there's transportation manufacturing companies. It can go to them. There are manufacturers of modular homes. If there's, if there's money going to housing, have it go to these companies. We just really have to think differently. I, I can't remember who it was, who's someone on the last panel. I don't know her name, but it was the only woman on the panel. I think it's the only one. Um, she said <laughs> that we can't, Stephanie, Stephanie, status quo, no more. It hasn't gotten us anywhere thinking the ways we used to think. And it's that old saying, you know, um, which I can't remember, but something about it, when you think about doing the same thing over again, that's the definition of crazy. Amen. We are at the definition of crazy. That's absolutely right. Well, let's, let's jump into now some of the funding that's coming. 
And as we all know, with federal funding, there are restrictions, there are limitations, there are controls that are put in place. And as you look at the projects, especially you, Gustavo, and you, Tokes, from a, a standpoint of how that funding should be used, how do we ensure that that money will, will create sustainability, equity, and access, both from a project's perspective and workforce perspective? What would you guys say are the right way to use those funds to achieve that? Let's start with you, Gustavo. Well, first of all, I just want to point out, uh, Tops mentioned the investments in transportation by the state. Uh, unprecedented historic investments by the state on housing mm -hmm. creation as well. $22 billion last year in the California Comeback Plan, an additional $2 billion this year in the California blueprint that the governor just released a few weeks ago. Of the $22 billion last year, $10 billion goes into production of affordable housing because obviously housing shortages are happening across the income spectrum. But when you look at the shortages in the affordable housing side, people, housing for people that earn 80% or less of the area of income, I mean, the shortages are enormous, abominable. And an additional $12 billion investment in housing for the unsheltered. We all know the problem of homelessness in this area. The literature, the research is conclusive. The number one problem why homelessness has gotten so out of control is lack of housing. Despite some of the sound bites that you hear in a national news network that I'd rather not mention that <laughs> is all about mental health and addiction, it is lack of housing what has made the problem of homelessness so acute. So, we are, again, resolute in how strategically we are deploying affordable housing dollars for more production, for more preservation, more protection, where it's built so that people that already live in affordable housing are not priced out. And there's a lot of conversion from affordable to market rate. Those people, where are they going to go when they are paycheck to paycheck from becoming homeless? So, it is really a strategic, the partnership between, to your question, between the state and local and localities. The state can provide a ton of carrots and sticks for the creation of more housing. And the state legislature has done a tremendous job in incentivizing more housing creation. Just SB9, that controversial bill from last year that basically, it's in a nutshell, the end of single family zoning across the state is the ability to split one single family lot into two or three to create more housing. Th those types of, of care, those incentives, are very, very important from the state pushing down to localities. But approvals of housing from planning commissions, city councils, at the boards and commissions, that yeah. happens at the local level. Yeah. And so it is extremely important that we hold local jurisdictions accountable for producing their fair share of housing. And there is a lot of opposition and pushback. And elected leaders respond to that type of community opposition to prevent housing from being created. So it is the partner. It is, it is not so much the restrictions on housing, but the will of the people and the local elected leadership that is going to create more housing across the state. And if we do that, I think we can reverse the trend. It's going to take a long time, but we can reverse it. In the last quarter, we saw a jump of 15% increase in housing permits compared to the last quarter of 2020. So we are seeing a progression in spite of labor shortages. But again, it is about accountability at the local level to create the housing that is. It's a partnership. It's not just on the state or the feds. We need to work closely with the local officials. Love it. Tokes, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, to uh, Gustavo's point, there's obviously a connection between what you're seeing and in, in increased house, housing production and poverty. From 2019 to 20, uh, 2021, roughly, we've seen a 3% reduction in poverty um, in the state of California. So we're heading in the right direction as we continue to make those, um, those, these kinds of investments in infrastructure. But to your question, when someone tells you something's a priority, whether it be an organization or an individual, the way to find out whether or not it's truly a priority is to say, okay, what kind of actions are you taking, number one? What kind of policies or regulations are you putting in place? And number three, 
where are your resources going? Just look at my credit card statement or look at my debit card statement. Where are you spending your money? That's the priority. If your house or your car is the priority, you will see in my car note that it's $4,000 a month because I drive a Bentley. I think that's the most important thing for me. The same thing with organizations, the same thing with us as individuals. Um, from a transportation standpoint, what, what I think is working, um, like I mentioned before, is the fact that those things are starting to align. They, they're starting to really align. I, I believe we have, as a society, as a nation, we know the wrongs that we've done. We've been clear on that. But we've paid a lot of lip service to take in real action and putting resources and policy in place. If we're going to move forward, especially on the equity front. We, we can talk about climate and, and some of the other issues. We've got to move from symbolically addressing these issues to systemically addressing them. From symbolic to systemic. We've done a lot of symbolism, a lot of surface level change. But if we truly want to make a, a lasting impacting difference, it's got to be systemic. And I think we're finally there. One of the examples that I can point out from the bill, it's the smallest part of the infrastructure bill that passed. It's something called reconnecting communities. Uh, that's a component of the infrastructure bill. Climate has a more than $50 billion piece, and there are huge components across the board, but the smallest piece is reconnecting communities. It's a billion dollars over five years. So essentially for all of America, $200 million a year over five years. But nevertheless, it's a seed that's been planted. It's going to make a difference. The federal government has never admitted, never admitted uh, to this level um, as a nation that the way we built that infrastructure system had significant negative impacts on underserved communities. That's never been a public, full public admission. This investment shows that we're finally saying that, that the way we built our transportation system in this country over the last 60, 70 years, it had negative impacts. Now, did it lift us up as a nation? Did it make us the envy of the world? There's no arguing that. There's a reason why China is making the investments that they're making, because they saw where we were um, as a nation. Uh, but finally, um, the resources to try to reconnect communities um, with that, uh, the infrastructure that we know has created many divides uh, is something that's pretty, pretty exciting. Love that perspective. Tracy, I, I want to twist a little bit the question I'd like you to answer. I know you were preparing. I know you were thinking ahead about what you wanted to say, but I want to just shift it a little bit. When you think about this one-time funding that's coming and the project that these gentlemen are going to be overseeing, how do we ensure that those things result in long-term sustainable employment opportunities for our most diverse workforce future, and also protect the environment. Two things I know that you're both passionate about. How do we ensure that what they're working on achieves those outcomes? We've got about a minute for that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, we're, I entered the tech ecosystem in the late 80s, yeah. and I worked on the space shuttle program. So when everyone makes everything cool. <laughs> complicated, I say it's not rocket science because I you worked know. in that, so I know what it is. Um, you know, and there was a lot of money that came to the internet it's called DARPAnet at that time. <laughs> that then all these private sector companies are making gazillion dollars off of, yeah. right? So. And you know, I was on the innovation panel, I watched the innovation panel, and one of the portfolio companies, one portfolio of an investor had 2,000 jobs open that they couldn't fill. Now that's, this sector is, most of us can't work in the tech sector. It is an elite group of people that can work that. 90% of the country cannot work in the tech sector. Yet all this money and all this time and effort are going into innovation in the tech sector. It's not equitable. Uh, see, 98.7% of all assets under management in this country are managed by white men. So the finance industry that moves 
everything, that controls everything, makes decisions, where money goes, if the government is not making sure that money goes to women and people of color, yeah. we're on the road to a country we do not recognize because there's gonna be 1% of the population that is living high on the hog mm -hmm. and the other of us are eating the pig's feet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so a friend of mine said, um, finance, and finance does kind of rule the world. It's not software that's eating the world, it's, it's money finance. and finance. Finance is not about money though, it's about power. Power meaning agency of knowing of who gets what, who grows, and we have to shift that, that the R&D money that went to SpaceX, that went to Tesla, and now they're complaining about paying taxes when they got <laughs> our tax money to be these gazillion dollar companies. Right. It's just, I don't understand it, but that's gotta change. This money has to go to women and people of color. Women get less than 1% of all venture capital. Women of color, specifically black and brown women, less than 0.1%. That's a rounding error. Yet our businesses are more successful. Now, what the, you know, What's what the, the effing F? <laughs> you know, I don't understand why people want, so this money from the federal government if it's going to the private sector, it's got to go equitable to women and people of color so that it's not just 0.1% of the businesses that are important to us are getting capital, but we switch that. And I, I recommend all of you, you were a state senator, senator Tell them this is where the money needs to go. And it doesn't, it's not a zero sum game that if I get money now, some white guy is not gonna get money. We know how much money is sitting out there. Not being used, not knowing where to go, so they keep pushing up the valuations of companies because they're like, I don't know where to, to throw my money, so I'm gonna keep throwing it at that company. That's gonna hurt all of us. Love it. Let's give so, her a round of applause yeah. on that. That's just <laughs> phenomenal. We. This is super important. It's time to take a few questions from the audience before we wrap up. And we've got uh, a couple of minutes here for maybe two or three questions. Who in the audience would like to ask one of our panelists a question? By a raise of hands. I see one right here, Shane. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now you have to ask. Now you have to ask a question. <laughs> okay. We're that good. Wow. We are. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent coverage of the topic. We do have a question over here. Thanks, Shane. Oh, there over there. In the back. In the back. Right back there. Hi, Dale Smith. I'm the Dean of the College of Business at LMU. Um, love the comments that y'all shared. I'm curious, how do we create more opportunities for these entrepreneurs to get the visibility in the VC community and or in the money that the government is giving away? Sometimes it, I wonder if it is access and knowledge about these opportunities and how can we support BIPOC and women entrepreneurs in really knowing where to go, how to get the help to be able to apply when they may not have those skill sets to know how to apply? Great question, Tracy. Um, okay, so this is when trickle-down economics actually works. You, in the VC if, ecosystem, there are fund allocators that invest in fund managers, and then the fund managers invest in entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurs hire people. Well, if it's 98.7% white men, what is that gonna look down like throughout that value chain? So this money needs to go to one, allocators or funds of funds and venture funds by women of color and people of color because that's what our network looks like. So I know where to find, you know, maybe not kids in college because I'm not hanging around at colleges that much, but I know how to find entrepreneurs of color and women because they're in my network. If I, you know, if you're a white man, you're gonna turn to Joe and say, oh, I have my white man friend, Joe, here. I'm gonna work with him, that's just easy. But to me, I can turn this way, and I have my black guy friend, or my black woman friend that looks like me, and that's where my money's gonna go. So it's at the top. It can't, we can't rely on the entrepreneurs to do all the work, 
you know, people of color are doing, and women are doing all the work. We can't save democracy and do everything else, right? We have to, people have to, from the top, be able to bring money down to us. And we have, that's where I'm talking about money is about power. And I want the power to decide where the capital goes so that the capital, the people who get the capital look like me and that, but it looks like all of us and not just one segment. So once again, it's got to go to the VCs of color so that they can go to their network who look like them. Excellent. Thank you, Tracy. That's great. Uh, do we have any, another question from anyone? We have one more question over here and then we'll go to a wrap up. My question's for Gustavo. We talked about uh, the importance of building denser communities, infill development, closer to jobs. I mean, that's wonderful. So one of the things that I'm concerned about as an economist is what policies or what can we put in place, what do you think we can put in place so that we, the market has the incentive to build this, to build this type of housing, uh, to encourage living in multifamily housing, for example, and in older housing and in, in the city. So what, what sort of policies do you think would be uh, effective at providing those incentives? Thank you for that question. When I say that there is a historic level of investment in housing production, especially on the affordable housing side, all of that money, $22 billion from last year, an additional $4 billion this year, all of that, when we are deploying that, we are redefining the criteria in a way that we focused on pro-housing incentives that will have to inevitably uh, include uh, points that make that type of housing, the housing that is infilled, the housing that reduces vehicle mile travels, the housing that is denser for multifamily units, all of the criteria for how that funding is deployed has to be redesigned in a way to fully incentivize that. And, and, and you know, we see it, a lot of the housing, affordable housing that is created in the state has to compete for bonds and tax credits. Investors buy that in order to, uh, uh, for developers to create the type of housing that we need in the state. And all of that criteria in the last two years has changed in order to focus on the types of incentives that will uh, foster, will propel the housing creating opportunities that are focused on location, are focused on areas of high opportunity, are focused on areas that, uh, that really cement the notion that housing is an anchor, that everything revolves around it. You know, the, core, the, the proximity to job centers, the proximity to healthcare facilities, the amenities, parks, libraries, the quality of the school, the quality of the air you breathe or the, the water you drink. All of that in the state currently is being redefined to create the incentive apparatus that will put those, that housing in a winning position every time. Thank you. Well, we're at time, guys. What I'd like to do is to give each of you an opportunity in just a one minute summary. What is the most important takeaway you want this group to know about your community area when it comes to economic development in the future here in, in California? Tracy, let's start with you. Trust women and people of color with money to do what they know is best. Mm. Love it. it. Thank you. Tokes. Yeah, so when I think about where we are today as it relates to transportation, I, you hear the term a lot, and it was actually used um, on stage today that rising tides lift all boats. But we have to remember that there are many people whose boats, their sails have been torn, that there are holes in the bottom of their boat. That no matter how much the tide rises, their boats will not float. Their boat will not move. If we don't go back and fix those sails and plug those holes, 
in those boats, their boats would never move. Their boats would never rise. The responsibility and the opportunity in front of us is to do exactly that. What the infrastructure funding we have to what you're describing. We have to go back. We have to go back and fix those sails and plug those holes and truly lift all boats. Thank you. Love it. <laughs> we'll give you the final word, Gustavo. Housing is the great equalizer. That's why when the pandemic exploded, if you, other than having inherent health conditions that put you at risk, the other important factor, that, the most important factor you needed to have is a place to go, a place to call home, to go and be protected, be safe. That's right. So housing is the great equalizer, but housing, it's, the, the housing market has been extremely unequal. There is great inequities in who access to housing, who can afford housing. So if we want truly an economic recovery, it has to be an inclusive economic recovery and housing has to be measured by how equitable the housing market responds to the people that need it the most. Thank you for summing up all three of you. I want to be on behalf of the LADC, I want to say thank you for being our panelists today. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thank you very much, Aaron Osman and the panel. We have one more question. Can you bring out the Bentley for your jokes? <laughs> We're just about to wrap up, but first, to wrap things up officially now, and to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Chung to the stage to close out the program. Stephen Chung, CEO of the LEDC and President of World Trade Center Los Angeles. By the way, Tokes, you make me sound like Shirley Temple up here, so super. Thank you, Frank. And uh, we appreciate you all for joining us today. And don't forget, um, tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, Motec on Money, 7.90 a.m., listen to the interview um, to capture some of the things that we talked about today. Also want to thank our speakers, sponsors, and exhibitors, and also attendees for sticking with us all the way to the end. The 2022 LADC economic forecast shows us that we're still navigating through continued disruption and uncertainty in an economy in transition. And we've seen and heard about the various effects on the regional, state, and national economy. We have, to, we have had experts in the field take a closer look at the three ecosystems that can be impactful in creating a more equitable, sustainable recovery. Infrastructure, housing, and innovation. And what I learned is how interconnected these systems are, and many other systems as well. And what I also learned is that there's a lot of opportunities in front of us. There's a tide of funding that will be coming through the state, through the county, through, through the federal government. And this tide, as uh, Tuxum was mentioning before, and he actually took uh, my ending a little bit as well, is that these tides can actually lift all boats. And to add to what he's saying, what if you don't have a boat? It's not about your sail being broken. A lot of our communities never had the opportunity to have those boats. And so what Stephanie Wagen said earlier as well is that we cannot go back to the status quo. We need to help people build boats. We need to make sure they learn how to build their own boats. So when the tide comes, we can all be lifted together. And that's why it's so important. I'm so glad to have so many different partners from government, business, education, nonprofit, philanthropy here with us today. And we hope that you can share, we shared some experiences, thought leadership, and potential solutions for you to take back home to your communities and your workplaces. But before we bid you farewell today, I want to thank and I want to recognize all of the LADC staff. And I want them to stand up right now. Um, all the LADC staff, please stand up. We're so grateful. We're so grateful for their time, their dedication, and their service. It's been a tough two years for all of us, and our staff have been on the front line, working directly with the businesses, working with the recovery efforts, and they're able to bring a lot of this solution to the table. And through, whether they're working on business assistance, whether it's research, whether it's workforce development, international trade, industry cluster development, communications, marketing, their work is impactful every day and has brought us all together here today. 
And so on behalf of the staff and the board of LADC, we want to thank you and invite you to keep doing the work of driving our economy forward and to look to the LADC as a resource and as a community partner to rebuild a Los Angeles ecosystem and economy that's equitable, resilient, sustainable, and growing. Thank you for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you. One last thing is that Shannon and Julia's presentation that uh, shared so many great information will be available on our website, ladc.org, later, uh, uh, later today. Have a wonderful day, and I hope you guys make it out of traffic and go to the parade.